Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. I bet it's it's a nice afternoon there. It's it's the middle of winter, right? It's the middle of winter in Perth. Or becoming winterish. It's spring, early spring. Oh, I derp. I no, no, other way around. It's becoming winterish. <laughs> yeah. Spring is still spring in the southern hemisphere. It has similar qualities. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, show us what I know. That's awesome. All right. I I cool. always think like when was our last equinox? And then twenty second. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just barely spring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just barely spring. Yeah, this is when wait, this is when we were both at the Kawanga Institute and it was like it was just a really nice Yeah, that's right. Weather. It was spring because they had just come out of a really long cold winter. That was twenty twelve. That was, yeah, like September, October, November, December 2012. Mm. Yeah. When we first met. <laughs> feels like feels like yesterday. It does. It feels like a world Tim, away. Tim was over there too. That was that was such a cool spot. Well, everybody, Tim's welcome coming. to. What's that? I was going to say Tim's coming to Western Australia soon to teach appropriate technology. Awesome. We need to get yeah. Tim on here. Man, yeah, Tim is an app tech genius. Yeah, I I understand that. Well, he's the number one blogger anyone could ever ever talk to. Okay, so see some familiar names on here. Welcome back. We got B, Christina, um, Jay Valencia. A lot a lot of folks from here. Roberto Schifo, good to see you again. So great uh, for all the folks who are new. I see a lot of American audience. I'm surprised there are a lot of worldwide audience here, but I'm sure this is a lot of Australian folks are on here right now too. So make your presence known. Let us tell us, tell us where you're coming in from. Uh, yes, please do. Neil's in a bunker right now in Stanford. I'm, in, in, I'm in a bunker just in case. <laughs> What's a Stanford? Study cave. Stanford's a, Stanford's a university. Uh, Cool. That's where I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm just sitting in my living room, my jujitsu pants, ready to, ready to get started with this. We got Meg coming in from Sonoma. Oh, there we awesome. are. I want to hear some of you Australian folks sound off. Sound I off. I don't know. Maybe we don't have any Aussies. That, hey, oh, come on. There's all yeah, there. no, Oh, Cyprus. We're, we're, we're characteristically um, apathetic. <laughs> it's Wait, like, it's got to be like 5 a.m. in Cyprus. Hey, dedicated Roberto, you are dedicated. If you, if you oh, we've got a, we've got someone from Sydney. We've got that's, someone from Sydney. Sarah's coming. That's in. That's almost Sydney. Australia, right? Yeah, we got almost Australia. Yeah. North <laughs> Carolina. Ooh, what a chance! This is a so someone's tuning in at midnight. We got Jay coming in from Stockton. Good to see you again. 7 a.m. in Cyprus. Don oh, from from uh, is that? WA is in Washington or Western Australia? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Well, regardless, this is going to be really cool. I've been, I've been reading uh, Dark Emu and uh, the other book. I, I kind of started reading, but I haven't bought it yet. It was like The Greatest to Stay on Earth. It's kind of about the ancient Australian history, and it's really mind-blowing. So this is going to be really exciting to hear Byron, the great storyteller, tell his perspective on deep Australian history because there's so mm -hmm. much, you know, all these, you know, people like Bill Mollison and uh, they were, you know, they, they were taking from the pages of people, you know, the peoples who have been doing this for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. So it's just what we thought was being discovered fresh is actually ancient history. So this is going to be really exciting. Um, so everybody, welcome back. When we get started officially to Sustainable Design Masterclass, uh, I'm Raleigh Latham, joined by my co-host and the one of the awesome, what do you call it, the, the director of Al Beta? No, you're like the the lead. I'm uh, the Alpha Wolf. The Alpha yeah, Wolf of Al Beta. Wolf. There you go, Neil Spackman. <laughs> and of those course. Alpha Wolf glasses. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And of course, Byron Joel. So before we get started, make sure turn off your distractions. I say this every time, but if your Italian grandma's texting you, be like, Grandma, I can't talk right now. Shush. They look, Grandma, 
I love you, and yes, I'll have a meatball sandwich afterwards. But please, I need some space right now. You know, exactly. don't just th- don't just shrug her off. You know, she she matters. Yeah, you let her know you're she alive. She about you too. Yeah. Awesome, and of course that same thing goes for Instagram, Facebook, and all those other tech apps. So this is you want to be present because he's going to drop some fantastic knowledge on you. So Neil, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce Byron. Joe. Welcome back, folks. Uh, I missed a couple of our webinars, but glad to be here tonight. Byron, this is like our fourth time that we've <laughs> tried to have you on here, and I'm yeah. really happy that we have now succeeded. Um, yes. So Raleigh, Raleigh's persistence has paid off. Yes. Uh, Byron is the founder of Regen Australis and also of Oak Tree Designs. He has been a professional designer in the uh, Regen Ag world for are you coming up on a decade, Byron? Yeah, I mean, I started like my, my entree to the industry was almost like 15 years ago, depending on where you put the flag in the sand, but yeah, a yep. while now. Yep, and um, we, I was happy to meet Byron at Permaculture Voices 2, and then we took uh, Rex 1 together in Santa mm. Barbara, California, and spent a few weeks together there. Mm. And um, I, even though we live on opposite sides of the planet, I feel like he is a kindred, he is kin to me. How's that, Byron? Yes, I would uh, agree. I feel the same way. Although you're a little more level-headed and grounded than I am, but I, I have that's cause, you know, that's very I'm endeared the, toward you. That's because I'm the alpha wolf. <laughs> the spectacle. <laughs> that's right. Um, but we're really pleased to have you on. Um, really pleased that um, that everything that you study, and I know you're really dedicated to continually learning about this stuff. So really happy to hear what you've got to say, and uh, take it away, Byron. Well, oh, and one Request. last thing: there, there's a musk yeah. oxen in Siberia right now. They were going to name you a bison, but I think they couldn't get it over. So there's a musk oxen named Byron Joel in Siberia right now. That's very flattering. Thank you very much. All if right. you ever get any photos of him, please send me. Oh, you got it. I'll be like, I can't hear Spackman. What's Spackman oh. saying? Oh, he's being muted. Okay. So go for it, Byron. Take. Okay. So is my is my big ugly mug going to be up still? It's it's small, but yes. yeah, okay, it's, it's like in mug. the corner, and it's not going to okay. be like your face and your mouth is the presentation. Okay, now, fellas, please feel free to ask questions as you go along, because you know, I, as much as I do love having the floor all to myself, it's also nice to have a bit of a real-time Q and A bouncing back and forth. We won't take too much time with it, but if you do have anything to ask, please go for it. I think a, a good approach too is like if you feel like there's a good opportunity for a break, we can take it mm-hmm. a break and open it to questions. But we'll let you go at least for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever, before sure. we do that. Okay. okay. Take it away. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. And as Neil said, this is probably the third or fourth attempt to actually make this happen. I'm very glad that we've uh, been able to do so. So yes, my name is Byron Joel. I'm from Southwestern Australia. I've been making a study of all the varied and complementary fields associated with what we call regen- uh, regenerative agriculture for about 15 years now. Um, and I'm fascinated by it all, the, uh, the, not just the agricultural stuff, but the ecology, the anthropology, and just what it means to the greater question of the human condition um, and going forth. So um, I'm going to talk to you tonight, today, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you are, about a concept I call Regen Australis, a project I call Regen Australis. So I'll get to that in a second. I'm not sure how much we'll get through because it's such a huge topic, but I wanted to give people a deeper understanding of the Australian context, the ecological, agricultural and cultural context of Australia. And I'm going to assume that most of the people on the line watching this are tuning in have at least a rudimentary understanding of regenerative agricultural principles. So I'm not going to flesh out the basics of holistic management, permaculture, key line, agrarian platform, 
and, and so on and so forth. Um, if you if you don't know and you're interested, I'll, in your own time, perhaps you can go and take a deeper dive. But I'm going to focus on Australia again. I'm not sure how much I'll get through because it's a big story. Um, I also wanted to clarify that these are some of these are very sensitive topics politically, um, like everywhere around the world at the moment in Australia, the subjects of race and heritage and ethnicity and genetics and land stewardship and all those things is pretty um, not quite as volatile as in the US I have to say but in Australia it's it's still quite a sensitive topic so I do approach this with as much respect as I can possibly muster especially for the traditional landowners of um, Australasia um, and we'll, we'll go into that more later and I must I want to say as well that as is um, uh, kind of common in Australia, to let Indigenous Australians, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders know that they're to be careful if, if they are sensitive to images of um, deceased um, relatives, because there are some in this. So um, with that, let's get into it. This is one man's humble opinion. I am not a professor. I'm not a PhD in any of this. This is just my ob observations over the years of having studied this stuff. So Regen Australis, connecting with country. So this all began, it, it, part of its genesis was a few years ago where I wrote an article on Dehesa, which we'll go into more later if we have time, but it's a Dehesa is a silvopastoral system of oak savannah uh, under which stock animals are run. It's an ancient system in the Iberian Peninsula, and I was writing about it as a potential, um, potentially very viable eco-agricultural application and model in Australia because we have similar climates. And I, in the first two or three paragraphs, I remember mentioning, I think I wrote verbatim that the future holds um, acute and particular challenges for the human populations of Australia's um, temperate climates. And I listed a couple of them, you know, like projected drying trends and, you know, poor soils and da da da. And, but then I went on quickly to the crux of the article. But I remember thinking to myself, I have to go back and flesh that out. And I did so eventually. And I remember just it, this, when I put pen to paper and started thinking about these challenges that Australia faced, it just, it went on and on and on and on. And armed with my, understanding of and appreciation of the realities of the human ecology interface and what that means it suddenly became very clear to me that Australia was potentially in a lot of trouble um, I also had an experience in Morocco in which I've recently fleshed out in a TEDx talk which isn't quite available yet but um, all of these things coalesced to give me a very very sharp appreciation for the challenge of the Australian context. So I began to write it out and I was like, oh, this is going to be a book. This is no, not a book. This is going to be a podcast. And I, I'm still not exactly sure of the formatting, but it's called Regen Australis. And it is its mission statement, if you will. Its aim is to explore and formulate the means by which human populations may develop regenerative cultures at bioregional scales anywhere in the world using West Australia as a working example. It's quite a mouthful, but basically just as like my mentors before me, uh, Mollison, Holmgren, Doherty, um, and intellectual mentors that I didn't get to meet or work with like um, Yeomans, th there was a formatting, there was a systematizing of these ideas. So there, were, there was deep observation of landscape and, and culture and then there was uh, recognition of challenges, then there was um, identifying solutions, and then there was a formatting of it. All of those things, permaculture, key line, agrarians, um, and in holistic management indeed, the, the beauty of them is that they're systematized and formatted, so they're very easily transmittable to other people. Others can pick it up, read it, understand it, and carry on, and I wanted to do the same thing. The principal premise of Regen Australis is that modern contemporary Australian cultures are dangerously maladjusted to the ecological realities of the Australian continent. 
Um, here we have a picture of um, ladies playing croquet and tennis in the 1890s in Australia in full English costume, long sleeves, petticoat, um, bonnets. They would have been very, very hot, but it was as if they hadn't realised they weren't in England anymore. And Australia is still doing that. Um, it's uh, a relatively recently, you have a population of people under very strange um, migratory circumstances, you'd say, coming from a landscape that in no way resembled Australia and then continuing to insist upon their own cultural practices, understandably. But we are still doing that and we haven't had, um, it's like Australia hasn't have a, taken a collective deep breath and, and said to itself, ah, we ain't in Kansas anymore, Toto. What are we gonna do about it? So the principal question from that, how do we best develop regenerative cultures in Australia, particularly within the context of crisis? Indeed, how? Well, there's plenty of themes and practices we use. And this talk isn't so much about fleshing out the deep nuts and bolts of the re re um, Regen Australis um, format, but this is more an introduction to why I'm talking about these things. And then we'll go on into the Australian context. But we, we explore, agroecological models from around the world, traditional agricultural systems, um, response to crisis and collapse, you know, places around the world that have had acute and swift eco um, and economic collapse, the USSR, Argentina, um, Cuba, places like that. Decolonization, which is just, um, I'm not sure how comfortable I am even with that word, but basically that's just about trying to get our um, heads out of um, colonial headspace, and that's a whole discussion. We don't have time for it now, unfortunately. Global political and economic patterns, and very importantly, bioregionalism and climatic analog, which is another sub project of Regen Australia, it's called Sibling Regions Pro uh, Project. All of these things can be found on my website, which is oaktreedesigns.com.au. The key parameters within the study or design challenges, because it occurred to me that design is good design is as much about risk management as anything. And it's our limitations, the, the um, challenges, the limitations, which provide the parameters for our decision-making. Neil would appreciate that um, in Saudi Arabia at his project, the, one of the greatest parameters there or design challenges is its aridity. Right, so that those, those challenges, what you have least of, your limiting factors are the parameters that define what you're gonna do with the place. Um, those parameters are divided into eco-agricultural, cultural energy, like fuel energy and economy. So let's look at some of the eco-agricultural stuff. Let's look at Australia, the anomalous continent. Now, it is an anomalous continent. I've said a few times now that Antarctica, which is often called the Gondwanan twin of Australia because they were joined, joined together. Antarctica has been shaped by ice and Australia, at least in relatively recent geological history, has been shaped by fire. And it is second to Antarctica, which is the most uh, strange, anomalous and acute and challenging land, continent on the planet to the point where it's non-habitable non -hab by humans. Australia is second to that. It's the strangest, it's the most challenging, it's the most unusual. It, it seems to, and it doesn't quite break, but it seriously bends some basic ecological principles, um, particularly through a holistic management lens, which I hope to get into later. So I thought we'd start at the beginning. Like I said, um, Australia was one of the Gondwanan continents, which was the supercontinent after the breakup of um, the first supercontinent, which was, I can't remember, the Southern Hemisphere one was Gondwana, the Northern Hemisphere was Laurasia, but I forget what they were called when they were combined. So Gondwana began to split 150 million years ago, and you see Australia here, um, began to drift to the north with Papua New Guinea and New Zealand attached um, and it was isolated as an island for 40 million years which is an extremely long time right so like everything evolved in isolation the plants and the animals all the flora and fauna the entire ecology evolved in isolation um, 
once it got to its relatively, you know, where it is now, more or less, which where it abuts the um, Sunda plate, the Indonesian Southeast Asian plate, it it um, it was called Sahul. It's known in in geog geology as Sahul. So the Australasian there's the Australasian plate, and then the ancient continent upon which there was like land bridges between Tasmania and the mainland and New Guinea and whatnot. That's known as Sahul. This is um, this particular image was at the Pleistocene sea level low stand around 25,000 years ago, and you can see here that there was a land bridge between New Guinea and Australia, but there still was no land bridge between the Sunda locale and Sahul. There was always there always had to be a crossing of water. Um, and it, also worth noting now is that back then, in fact, as far back as about 50,000 years ago, the ecology and uh, w was kind of similar. It started changing around 50,000 years ago. We'll get into that. But for a very long time, for at least the majority of human habitation here, as long as we, as far as we understand, it was quite similar in that the, the interior of Australia was arid and then there was this ring of relatively temperate habitable space um, and then up into the tropics it was more tropical i'm from down here in southwestern australia which is a kind of an island of green between the indian ocean the southern ocean and the interior deserts okay so about the jury is still out on how early Homo sapiens arrived here, um, but about some people say 50, some people say 80. We'll get into that a bit more. But before this drying event, somewhere around 50 to 40, 35,000 years ago, it was a very different place in terms of the flora and the vegetation. So that the paleo flora of Australia was adapted to a much moister climate, um, and it was dominated by things like these conifer coniferaceous coniferaceous species this family here is oricoria which is like this one is the bunya pine which is oricoria bidwillii um, relative of oricoria heterophylla which is the norfolk island pine and things like the woolamai pine the kari of new zealand and polynesia um, and the monkey puzzle pine of south america um, amazing food source. I mean, this guy, the bunya, is one of the great undervalued, underexplored food crops of the future. Um, and I happen to have written an article about it, which is on my website as well. Um, this is Podocarpus, which is another conifer species, coniferaceous con species. So not neither of these are true pines, but they're in the great conifer family. Um, the Podocarpus genus are famous for these fruits. They're sometimes called plum pine. Also, there was plenty of palms and plenty of casuarinas. Um, all of these things are still in Australia, but of course now it's dominated by eucalyptus um, because of the changing climate, which we'll get to. So the fauna of, of Pleistocene Australia, if you will, um, was very interesting. Like, like other places around the world, there was megafauna. And it's, it's interesting, when I was a kid, everyone was into dinosaurs and no one really talked about the mammalian Pleistocene megafauna of the planet, but it's gained a huge momentum and interest over the last 10 years, and rightly so, because it's a fascinating topic. And it's one of those topics that I found that um, through a, a, the lens of understanding holistic management and the, the predator-prey relationship, rangeland relationship had becomes um, very, very intriguing. Um, and in Australia, we had megafauna as well. Um, it, of course, in Australia, the fauna were dominated by marsupials, the marsupiala order. Um, that's because largely it's argued that Australia was, all, although it was relatively greener and moister once upon a time, it's always been quite challenging. Because it was the oldest continent on the planet, it's been argued, it's, and it hasn't seen glaciation or volcanic activity to the degree that other continents have to replenish soil the soils are in incredibly old and um, leached of nutrient and therefore poor 
And so it's as if this kind of foundational layer of the ecology has been, um, you know, it, it reduced. It's like this, this the, the, the bank account, the mineral bank account has been so low that the ecology, the economy of the ecology has had to be very tight and the, only the toughest things survive like me. And um, the thing with marsupials, they're just, they're incredible digesters. I mean, kangaroo dung is, it's, it's amazing. If you've never looked at kangaroo dung, rush out now and find some. Because it's just, you can see it's had every last drop of water, moisture, and therefore nutrient extracted from it. And it's just hay. It's like dry hay. It's incredible. Um, and also the way that they breed, like marsupials, many of the types of marsupials, the Deprotodon DA um, family, they can be three kinds of pregnant at once. So like a kangaroo can have a joey, a baby roo, you know, yay big, whatever, in its pouch at any given time. It can also have in its pouch attached to a, a nipple, a tiny little almost embryonic baby because when they're born, the marsupials, they're tiny, they're embryos and they crawl um, out of the womb and latch onto a nipple. And then at the same time, a mother kangaroo or marsupial can have, she can be, have been impregnated but she can have that embryo on hold in stasis, waiting until the environmental conditions are right to actually then, uh, you know, press play on the development of that zygote into an embryo into a, and then a fetus. So it's, they're incredible animals and things like kangaroos, which are the only remaining megafauna in Australia. I, I mean, on top of all of those things, their form of bipedal locomotion is has been described as being the most energy efficient form of locomotion in the animal kingdom. Um, it's just incredible watching a kangaroo bounce across the landscape. They use hardly any energy at all. So there's marsup there were marsupials, there were large reptiles. This guy here is Megalania, um, Var Varanus Megalania or Varanus prisica. It changes names every now and then, but Basically, it was a close relative of the Komodo dragon, but it was about three times as large. It was about 12 meters long. Um, all of these were around when humans first got to Australia. It was a very different place. Another really interesting beast, really interesting beast that not many people know about that was alive when humans got to Australia. It was called Quincana, and it's a, it was the last relict species, the last remaining living fossil of a once vast clade of terrestrial crocodilians. So it was a cro true crocodilian, but it was terrestrial and its legs weren't splayed out under it. It was, they were underneath itself for walking and running on land and its teeth were sheared for slicing meat as opposed to just holding and drowning and swallowing whole. Um, serious monster. And there were giant pythons and all sorts of things. Um, so unlike the Northern Hemisphere, unlike other continents like Eurasia, but specifically North America, that experienced an extinction event of the megafauna, the Pleistocene mammal extinction event somewhere around 10 and a half thousand years BC, give or take. Um, Australia's, and that's a whole discussion in and of itself. Um, and I'd point, it, it's always long been suggested that it was humans arriving by the Bering Land Bridge that, um, you know, and their hunting pressure that caused that. But there's, I'll point you towards a guy called Randall Carlson and his research into a potential comet strike on the uh, um, glacial ice cap over the Great Lakes region around that time that was a potential cause for it. Anyway, unlike that extinction event, there was an extinction event in Australia earlier, around 45,000 years ago, give or take a bit, uh, where the megafauna of Australia started dying off. So it's been, it's been human, human hunting has been the main cause, or not human hunting so much as pressures caused by humans hunting, plus the, um, plus the uh, addition of fire stick agriculture to the landscape which slowly dried it out and changed the ecology in concert with the ice age come hitting 
and that causing a drying. So in Australia, and like many places actually, the Ice Age caused um, a, a drying effect. It got colder and, and drier, like a tundra step. And these two elements, the human impact and that Ice Age impact, um, were enough to change the climate so much that these animals started dying out. That's the going um, description. Um, another really interesting aspect of the Australian megafauna, and I must say, I'm not an expert on this, but I've looked around and I've, I've read what I can read, and I haven't found, there's, there's a few interesting books, and I, if you're interested, I'd point you to Tim Flannery's The Future Eaters, that's an interesting one on kind of paleo Australia from the, you know, from the time humans arrived till onward. Um, but what I don't understand, and we'll cover this more, is that for such a brittle environment, for such an arid environment with so many, so much grassland and savanna, there, and and for 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 what I understand to have been at least once upon a time big herds of grazing herbivores like kangaroos. We're not sure what the Deprotodons and all of those guys did, but um, there, there were no pack hunters, you know. The, in front of you on this um, slide here, you have, to our knowledge, given in the fossil record, these were the large terrestrial marsupial, sorry, mammalian hunters, predators of the Australian continent. So we've got, here, Homo sapiens here in, for, in the form of indigenous Australia, Australians. This guy here, which is my personal favorite, this is Thylacoleo carnifex, very interesting animal. It's got the, it, it's actually evolved, it's in the um, Deprotodon clade. So it, all of its other relatives are kangaroos, koalas, Deprotodons, possums, that kind of thing. Um, it's not, and, and that, that marsupial clade are uh, usually or characteristically always herbivores or at sometimes omnivores. These guys, the Tasmanian tiger, the thylacine and the, the quoll and the Tasmanian devil, they're diacerids. They're the, they're the largely predatory and carnivorous marsupials and they're quite primitive. This guy here evolved from carn uh, herbivores like koalas and wombats. And he has the strangest dentition in you will ever see. Um, look it up, a thylacoleo skull. And they, based on the skull, they think that it had the strongest bite of any mammal ever. And a 150 kilo thylacoleo could outbite a hyena or a 250 kilo African lion. But the point is that none of these are pack hunters. They're all opportunistic scavengers. We think this guy, thylacoleo, was a ambush predator like a leopard um, uh, and then you have the megalania the, the non-mammal predators the megalania and the giant python and quincana they were like they, they were likely opportunistic scavengers and ambush predators as well there's no pack hunters so it's a very interesting question does that mean there were no mega herds back then very possibly because you know for those who have studied their holistic management and the ecology of hm you'll know that pack hunting predators only live and exist where there are big herds of animals to hunt in that way. And those herds of animals only exist in brittle environments, or at least those environments where there are rangelands, grasslands, savanna, prairie um, on which to feed. You don't have pack hunters where there aren't grazing herbivores and you don't have grazing herbivores where there aren't rangelands. So um, you flip, the flip side of that is when you have dense woodland uh, in, in non-brittle environments, whether that's, you know, a, a non-brittle coastal European woodland or like a subtropical or tropical rainforest like the Amazon. You have in, in those cases, you have largely solitary hunters like tigers or jaguar that hunt relatively solitary herbivores, which are rare in those places. You know, like try to think of yourself, think for yourself, what is, name one Amazonian, large, large mammalian herbivore from the Amazon. I can think of one and that's the tapir. There's probably more. There were once upon a time, you know, 
there were um, giant ground sloth and whatnot, all sorts of things. But um, the point is in those brittle um, forest, sorry, non-brittle forests, the herbivory is insectivorous. So what the whole point of why I say that is that perhaps this is an indication, the fact that there are no pack hunters in the fossil record, that was an indication that the ecology in which they lived was much denser woodland and much greener and moister. And there weren't so many rangelands, weren't so many savannas and grasslands, steppes. Human occupation of Sahul, the earliest conclusive Homo sapiens remains on the Australian continent uh, from Lake Mungo down here. And they, they're at 50,000 odd years. Before that, people thought that it was about 20,000 years ago. They assumed that humans arrived and it got pushed back to 50. I think it was in the 70s. It took a long time for them to actually agree to that and it got rewritten and it keeps getting pushed back, right? So recent archeological analysis of charcoal artifacts suggests as early as 65,000 years and that's up here in Arnhem Land, I believe. I forget the name of the site. So now it's, it, it, it's all but, you know, sanctioned scientifically. It's just got, you know, it'll take a couple more years for people to cotton on and the right papers to be written that up here, it's 65,000 years, but genetic research has inferred a date of habitation as early as 80,000 years. I believe there is um, ge geological um, evidence in the form of shell mounds called middens, with, you know, like sh tribes eating shellfish and they leave the mounds and they're dated in a very specific way. I think down here on the Victorian coast and that's been pushed to 80,000. So it may turn out that 80,000 years ago, Homo sapiens was down the bottom of Australia. Um, all of this in a world where we're still told in 2018 that modern humans left Africa in one migratory wave 70,000 years ago. It doesn't add up. Australia is increasingly throwing these curveballs um, in the, into the world of conventional paleoanthropology because it, it just, it's, a strange, it's a strange thing. Why would the earliest, why would the, the uh, earliest peoples to have left Africa been, be so far away if we, and dated to the same time that modern humans were meant to have left Africa. I didn't quite say that right, but you get my point. Um, other really interesting things about Australasia is this is the Wallace line. So everything on this side, whoop, pardon me. Everything on the, the south, southeast is the Sahul plate. And all of the animals and um, yeah, the birds and animals are Australian. Everything over here is Asian. So over here, it's like, you know, pygmy, rhino and tigers and elephant and monkeys and leopards. And down here, it's all, you know, marsupials and echidnas and tree kangaroos and that kind of thing. Because Australia is, you know, has, was isolated forever and it's been drifting north. So they've just met here. And there is this area in here called Wallacea where there's a bit of an overlap. So here in Java, you can see this is the old coastline of the Sunda Plate at the Pleistocene uh, sea level low stand 25,000 years ago. This is Java. So on this island of Java, they have found Homo erectus skulls that date to around a million years ago. So that's, that's a very long time ago. Um, and then across the Wallace line, just across this little jump in the water in the island of Flores, there are the little hobbits they found, the three foot tall diminutive um, human species known as Homo floresiensis, which are incredible. So not only are they not Homo sapiens, um, they're, they're arguably not even a, a dwarfed island form of Homo erectus. They, their morphology more closely resembles Homo habilis, which is the species it, considered in the direct lineage of human evolution that led to us before Homo erectus. You know, this is going way back. Um, and then there's the Denisovan DNA. So as it turns out, the peoples of this region, Australasia and Melanesia, on top of the 
three, four, five percent of Neanderthal DNA that all um, humans have, except for sub-Saharan Africans. The people of this region have a, an additional four or five or up to six percent Denisovan DNA. Denisovan, the Homo Denisovo is, is another species of human. Um, don't have time to get into it, but it's very, very interesting. So there's lots of interesting stuff going on. Um, I actually recently started a Facebook page called The Secrets of Sahul um, to talk about all of these things. You can look that up. Am I still live? Do I have you guys? Can I have? Oh, you're live. live. Okay, cool. Be eating popcorn and watch. Mhm. Mm Is this going all right? Is the format okay? Does anyone need to go pee? <laughs> Well, I'm sure some people, they might even be on the toilet while watching this. So okay. Two things All right. I think yeah, cool, we have one question about, uh, yeah, was was the area brittle? Okay. It was a question from... Okay. Yes. Don was saying, he's from Western Australia, he said, we're assuming that the Australian environment was brittle. If it wasn't, what was it? Is that Don Woodcock? Don Woodset. Woodset. Okay, hi Don. Um, so, sorry, the question was, was the Australian continental ecology brittle? If not, what? If it wasn't brittle, then what was it? Well, well, this is the thing. Um, I, I don't know. It looks like, because from like fossil, um, fossil records and pollen records, that 50 odd thousand years ago, then back, it, was, it wasn't as brittle. I don't know exactly where on the brittle spectrum it would have landed, but it would, this is a huge question, right? And this is, I'm actually, I've, I've invited Darren Doherty to talk about this. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna be Darren and I spending an hour, two hours, three hours of a webinar just fleshing out this point, what was Australia? how did it become what it became and what are we going to do about it so it looks like it was less brittle then it looked like it became more brittle and it looked like it became more brittle from a combination of um, the effects of the ice age the, the drying and cooling coupled with the australian fire stick agriculture plus their pack hunter predation which we'll get to in a, in a moment so yeah i'll i'll let everyone know about that webinar um, and in the meantime, if you are interested in paleoanthropological mysteries of Australia, go to Facebook and search for Secrets of Sahul. I only started it like two days ago. Okay, so Indigenous Human Impact. So, so it's it's fifty thousand. Let, let's let's say eighty thousand years ago. Homo sapiens arrived because it looks like it's going to be something like that. I actually have a prediction. I think within the next decade we're going to find that it, it'll be it'll be established scientifically that it is at least eighty thousand years. I actually think it's more than that. I also predict that there will be the discovery of a non-sapiens hominid um, in the fossil record in on the Australian continent or maybe Papua New Guinea, or perhaps like a, well, it's already been done, not on the continent, but Flores is a, technically Flores is an Australian island in terms of continental whatnot. So it's been done, but I think it'll happen again, a non-sapiens species in the fossil record on Australia. And I also think that the out of Africa um, theory of modern human evolution is, is going to have, be turned on its head. Um, I, I think there were hominids across the entire old world. Uh, all the, I mean, we've got we've got Homo erectus in Georgia in Western Asia, dated at 1.8 million years, I think. And then uh, Homo erectus was in Java a million years ago. I think we're gonna, it's gonna actually turn out that the origins of uh, modern homo sapiens not hominids in general but homo sapiens sapiens is going to be more toward the eastern asian area anyway that's one man's humble uh, politically turbulent opinion so indigenous humans arrived 
Huh? That's fine? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. <laughs> no, this, this is great. This is great. Okay. Um, so Homo sapiens arrived on Sahul, you know, anywhere between 80, 100 to 80 to 60 to 50,000 years ago, something like that. They had time to coexist with the Australian megafauna. Now think about it. Like, I think what's his face, Harari, does, um, talks about this in *Sapiens* a little bit, where he talks about the, the cross, the Homo sapiens crossing of the water into Australia was like one of the greatest human eco cultural moments in human history and Earth history, and it's it's kind of true when you look at it. I mean, this island continent that had existed in isolation for 40,000 years, suddenly the first like large placental mammal stepped foot on it. You know, think about it. I mean, there's, there's Antarctica, strangest place on earth. Let's just put that to the side because it's so odd. But then every other continent you've got, Africa, Europe, Asia, North and South America, it's kind of the, 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 eco the ecological trophic card game it looks kind of the same you've got animals in the order of carnivora as the predators whether that's uh, you know pan the panthera genus or other big cats like lynx or puma um, you've got wolf hunting dog and all their relatives uh, bear whatnot and then you've got mega herds of grazing ungulates in the, in the rangelands and you know it's similar stuff right and even you know when 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 europeans first got to north america i mean they would have been like it, north america would have looked the way europe looked more or less you know 10 or twenty thousand years before you know so rich and bountiful and very similar. I mean, the geography was not identical, but similar. The hydrology was similar. The animals were similar. You know, wow, those wolves look cool. Or those, those, those lion are funny looking. Or that, those deer are different. That mulberry is unusual. Those oak trees are a bit strange. But, you know, they could identify deer and wolf and oak and mulberry. You know, when humans first got to... Australia, it, there was nothing like it. it. It's it's so different, and this is one of the questions. It seems to bend some of the rules of ecology, but how far does it bend it? And we're, we're trying to flesh out that discussion. So humans arrived there, and one of the things that I think they brought, apart from fire, was their pack hunting. So they arrived. Um, I reckon they would have arrived with the dingo, Canis dingo, the Australian wolf way earlier than the proposed 5,000 odd years. I, I don't see why that would have happened just 5,000 years ago. I understand what the fossil record says, but they would have been here for a, a longer than that with their human counterparts, I, I think. And the thing that that did, it's not, it's not that they're placental so much and not marsupial, it's that they're pack hunters. And uh, if it's, accurate that there weren't any or at least not many or none in the fossil record of pack hunters in Pleistocene paleo Australia then that's really interesting because Australian Aboriginals indigenous humans brought their dogs and together they were this pack hunting unit that would have really changed the ecology okay so that combined with the fire stick agriculture we, and the glacial drying as we've we've said that that turned the ecology from this relatively moist environment dominated by conifers and you know casuarinas and palms and cycads and that selection criteria of drying and burning selected for the the dry hardy and pyrophytic species of the eucalypts the motaceae um, and the acacia and the and the proteaceae that were always there but they would have been you know, living in the arid areas and on the fringes. And we just, we humans, our fire stick agriculture and the drying climate, just we created a way bigger niche. We expanded their reign, their regime until we have what we have now. But what, um, what I think also happened 
actually no, I'll save that for a bit later. But basically what happened was there was a rapid and acute change in ecology over the last 50,000 years. Um, I'll reference these books right here, Dark Emu and The Biggest Estate on Earth. They've already been mentioned, but Dark Emu, Bruce Pascoe, Biggest Estate on Earth by Bill Gamage, two of the most important books in and of Australia ever. I mean, it's making everyone rethink the anthropological and natural history of Australia. And m m very refreshingly, um, it's making colonial contemporary European Australia rethink the nature of Indigenous Australians and their relationship to the land because it's been much maligned. Hope to have time to talk about that more. So the current climate now, so you know the human the human uh, interaction plus the ice age drying caused it to go to what it is now. It dried out and it went to, at the time of 1788, when Europeans arrived, um, there was a lot of savanna. Okay, so it wasn't so much dense woodland and it wasn't all just prairie treeless grassland, it was savanna, you know, which is a grassy rangeland overstood by relatively thin, um, small stocking rate of trees. So a third of it is arid. A third of so all that central bit is arid. I mean, it's like it's arid. A third is semi-arid, and then another third is a combination of Mediterranean, which is like here where I am. This is a belt of Mediterranean. This is Mediterranean, um, and then cool, temperate, and subtropical and tropical. Can you guys see my cursor? Rile dog? All right, move it around a little bit. Yeah, we can see yeah, your cursor. Can, yeah. Okay, cool. else I didn't see ask it? That Quick comment from um, Jay Valencia saying, Pleiadians is extraterrestrial originators of Australian Aboriginals? LOL. Is that a question or a statement, Valencia? <laughs> I guess it was a, just a comment. No, I'm, I'm actually... It's beyond the scope of the discussion of this pod uh, webinar, but <laughs> I, I, could, I could chew your ear off about that too, if you wanted to, but and for another time perhaps. Um, yeah, dark em I'll say that the indigenous Australians, like um, many Southern hemispheric traditional indigenous peoples claim to have some sort of heredity from the Seven Sisters constellation known as the Pleiadians. Um, that's, again, it's a whole different discussion, but it is interesting. So Australia has, it, it, it's, it, it is different. So it's different in lots of ways. It's, it's isolated, the flora is different, the fauna is different, the, it, it, the hydrology is different, you know, the the, the geology, et cetera, there's super harsh UV, there's unreliable wet, weather patterns, and it's br pretty brittle. So very quickly, the brittleness scale as described by Alan Savory, um, it, it's not describing so much rainfall or precipitation and, that an area gets, it's describing how much atmospheric moisture there is at soil, at soil level, which allows the process of biological metabolism to occur. If it's too dry, biology doesn't run. If there's enough moisture um, coupled with warmth, then it runs. So something that's very non-brittle down here, one or two is jungle or, you know, or like England is very non-brittle, very moist. You know, like um, I'm in Perth where there's about 600 millimeters of rainfall a year and England, London has less than that, I think. It's about 500. I can't remember the exact number, but it's about 100 mil less. So the difference is that Perth goes into a, a brittle period for most of the year. But in London, it's, it's all year, it's just drizzling. So it's not that the, the amount of precipitation, it's how much atmospheric moisture there is at any given time. Um, and very brittle, like deserts, right? So the big thing about this is that the brittle ecosystems of the world, their health and function is dependent upon the relationship between 
the large grazing herds of herbivores and the predators that prey upon them being intact, right? So if you remove those elements from the ecology of a brittle environment, the environment falls apart and becomes desert. In a non-brittle environment, you can remove large animals and because of the um, atmospheric moisture, it will continue to grow and metabolize. In the brittle environment, the animals, the herbivores, are the agency of moisture and um, biological metabolism. Australia was very brittle. The geology of Australia is different. So it's the oldest landmass on the planet. And again, like I said before, there's been relatively, like virtually no glaciation and virtually no volcanic eruptions to renew the mineral content of the soils. So they're very nutrient depleted. It's the flattest place on earth um, because of the erosion. Um, just near where I live, there's a range of hills which used to be Mount, a Gondwanan mountain range. And my ex-father-in-law actually discovered a riverbed, the remains of a Gondwanan riverbed that ran through the, those, only crossed the ridges. You can only see it in the ridges. And it was like an Amazon-sized river called the Kirup Conglomerate. It's all flat now. And that flatness um, made for a very different hydrology here. So unlike most of the, the world, and specifically, particularly the Northern Hemisphere, where there is the hydrology is, there's long serpentine rivers that, you know, that are, that are, um, that are full in, filled in the spring from like melt waters from the, um, mountains and, and glacial systems, right? We don't have so many of those. Most of our rivers or water systems were a long chain of ponds. So instead of a long unchoked running river, there would be a chain of ponds of wetlands, which there was flow through it, but there was this like great slow filtering process. And funnily enough, this is hard to get your head around, but as highlighted in the book, um, Back from the Brink by Peter Andrews, the floodplain, sorry, the, the chain to pond slash river systems in Australia are higher in the landscape than the floodplain itself. Get your head around that, right? And then when it, the big rains come and they do flood, it spills out like this big, you know, back flood swale system. You know, it's very, very strange. The flora, right? So the, the post um, Holocene flora, post Ice Age flora, now is dominated by the pyrophytic, meaning fire loving Myrtaceae family. So that's the eucalypts, um, the melaleucas, um, those guys, callistamins, all of those, the Myrtaceous species. Now, Myrtaceae is an old Gondwanan family and it's, it's it's like South America, which is another Gondwanan continent. It got all the cool Myrtaceae, or more accurately, their Myrtaceae species, Myrtaceous species, are evidence of their relatively humid um, environment, right? With all these big delicious fruits like guava and feijoa and gramachama, patanga, um, the Eugenia genus, right? They got all these big delicious fleshy fruits the Myrtaceae in Australia adapted to, to drought. Um, it's all like eucalypts with gum nuts, you know, hard, in, in, inedible for humans anyway. Uh, Darren Doherty pointed out to me a while ago, uh, he was referencing someone else, that Australia, it, the, the tree is not a land of fruit producing trees. What it does, what our, our trees do produce en masse is pollen. So it's a, it's a continent of insects and birds. And it's, it's, it's true, like we have incredible bird life, like even in the cities, like parrots and honey eaters and all sorts of stuff flying around because these, these eucalypts put out masses of nectar for them. Um, other families like Prote Proteaceae, of which the Macadamia um, is a member, which is Australia's, virtually Australia's only exported food crop. Um, and Fabaceae, the, um, Acacias. These species are successionally advantageous. Okay, so you look at the northern hemisphere, 
let's think of a, a climax canopy species like an oak. An oak won't just go and pop up out of the ground in the middle of a field. It, it usually has to follow a successional pattern, you know, like there'll be a grassland and then there'll be some scrub pop up in, this, in that. And then, you know, a jaybird or a squirrel will bury an acorn in that, under that scrub, which provides the perfect nursing environment. And slowly you get this environmental succession into a climax um, dynamic. In Australia, the climax species of any given area, like the eucalyptus species, in most cases or many cases, those species are also a, a primary or secondary succession species. A eucalypt, the same eucalyptus species, which will eventually dominate as a climax canopy species in a, in a climax ecology, that same species could pop out of, um, you know, a rubble in the ground, or you know, or a ploughed field, you know. So everything is tough and advantageous here. They are weeds. I mean, define a weed. Everyone's got a different, different definition of weeds. But eucalypts are a climax canopy species that are also a weed. Super tough. And they're allopathic. They 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 send out fumigant. Um, chemicals through their roots to, to, to kind of detract other things from growing and therefore are quite a antagonistic to conventional agriculture. And yes, they're pyrophytic. So they they don't just burn well, they're designed to burn well. Fire is like foreplay to a eucalypt. The other thing about the Australian flora is the loss of ethnobotanical knowledge because it's so different here and because of the degree to which the Aboriginal culture was decimated we don't know what does we don't we don't know what the ethnobotanical applications of the plants are really i mean there's some knowledge it certainly hasn't bled through into mainstream australia um okay so this is an important dynamic one that the biggest estate on earth by bill gamage points out when european colonial colonialists arrived in Australia, they noted, as is as can be read in old journals and botanist diaries and governor correspondences and as can be seen in old paintings, Australia was savannah largely. That is open grassland dotted by relatively few feature trees of magnificent size. And under those trees, there might be a little island of, of sub canopy shrubs and, and vines and herbaceous, you know, forbs and stuff, but largely it was very open. That was the result of the fire stick farming, the fire stick agricultural practices of the indigenous Australians. So after that 80,000, 50,000, whatever it turns out to be years of land stewarding techniques involving fire, and their pack hunting proclivities, as humans are, especially when there's a dog or a wolf by our side, it changed the landscape. And it changed from, a, you know, the relatively dense uh, woodlands and uh, greener, almost subtropical um, environs into Mediterranean, temperate to Mediterranean to semi-arid and subtropical Savannah. Savannah was very common. It's still very common in lots of parts of Australia. But what happened was European Australians came along, changed all that, and we'll get into that more. And uh, and I realised I put some of these slides in the wrong order, so bear with me. But I'll go on with this little thread. Um, European Australia came along within, like everywhere else around the world within a few years of Europeans' con first contact with an indigenous per peoples who had been removed, disease wiped out like the majority of the people, 70, 80, 90% of the population dead within a decade. This is a huge point that we need to bear in mind. And every time we review history, we need to understand that because by the time five, 10 years later, after the scout parties had sent word back to Europe, yeah, it's, there's land, everyone come over, and then you have the big kind of migration waves. And then and only then do you have the like 
the botanists and the anthropologists and the missionaries to actually making note and taking journals, the people that they're describing, the indigenous people there are a decimated, disoriented people on the bones of their ass. It, 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 it isn't indicative of who they were before initial contact. So that happened. There was a huge loss in um, numbers of Aboriginal Australians. And then of course, their land stewarding practices were interrupted because it, it was now the Queen's land, the Crown's land, the King's land. Um, and they, their fire stick agriculture practices were virtually stopped. Their pack hunting um, was stopped. Their encyclopedic, you know, ancient land stewarding practices were brought to a halt. Um, colonial stock animals were set upon the rangelands. Then most of that old timber was logged and sent to the old world. Like Australia, Australia sent so much timber to the old world. As far as I know, much of the old Siber Trans-Siberian Railway was built of ironwood, Australian timber, and it, it's crazy. Okay, so then once a logging party had been through an area and moved on, if it wasn't being grazed, then the seed bank in the soil, which is always, no matter where you are in the world really, really thick, just burst forward, forth. And you didn't have the Aboriginal fire stick farming and the animal impact as a result of that to, to bring down and cull um, and keep that forestry stocking rate ostens ostensibly thin. And what came back through was this hyper thick um, Australian bushland. So over the last, you know, four, five, six, seven plus generations of European Australians, we've grown up thinking that the Australian bush is the Australian bush and it's always looked like that. Uh, geologically speaking, ecologically speaking, it's not, it's very recent. And as a result, you have these infernos. So where you had this strategic and systematic, relatively cool burn going on in a mosaic pattern across the landscape for thousands of years with very, very clear intent and mechanics behind it. There was none of that. Now we now we have infernos. And they like seriously, the Australian bushfires are it's like hell on earth. It is absolutely insane. Like it I appreciate that wildfires anywhere around the world aren't good and they can get bad, but nowhere has a wildfire like an Australian dry sclerophyll woodland as a wildfire. It almost sterilizes the place, you know, it's so hot. I mean Mammals just nothing can outrun it, you know. It just it's it's incredible. It can take years for the um, ecology to bounce back, and that's a funny thing about the Australian ecology as well. It, it's so there's so few animals there, so you know there's a real sense of almost like I get a sense of loneliness almost when I'm out driving around parts of Australia. You see the old kangaroo, depending where you are, and then you see domestic farm animals, and then you'll see some feral, um, you know, introduced animals, but there's none of these big herds of anything swarming the landscape and with predators and none of that. It's, it's birds and little mammals, little marsupials, um, and then the ferals, but it's, it's very lonely. So to, make, to get back, this, these, the order of these has somehow gone awry a little bit, but it's okay. So this is something I've not heard described before. This is, I think I've talked to Darren Doherty about this, but, but except for between him and I and maybe a handful of other people like John Woodcock and others, um, I haven't heard this discussed because it takes a holistic management lens to appreciate what's going on. So Australia's poor soil has always been attributed to the fact that they are geriatric soils. They're really old. And because of the lack of glaciation and volcanic activity to renew the mineral content, they are very, very poor. That is an element, right? But in a world where there's, in an ecology where there is an intact, full house, trophic system, right, where there where all the ecological niches are being filled. Um, 
that's going to that, that those, that's going to have regenerative biological processes okay you don't need a high mineral content in a soil to have a strong healthy soil necessarily and to have a, a strong functioning flowing cycling biological ecological system so i i suspect and i'm not insisting upon this but i suspect because there was a, the australian megafauna extinction event has been it occurred tens of thousands of years before the other more recent megafauna extinction events that that lack of predator prey rangeland relationship has had coupled with fire-stick agriculture has seen the carbon levels in the Australian soil drop dramatically. So the nutrient levels in the soil may have all, may long have been very low. Okay. But I think if there was a rangeland predator relationship, uh, grazing relationship in Australia, then the soil carbon level would have been much higher than it is today. And I would like to look at studies to see that. Um, okay. So now we're going to jump into a little bit of a different thing. So European Australia, is everyone still with me? We're good. Oh yeah. You're still alive. We're still going. Still alive. Okay, cool. How's my hair? Atrocious. No, it's all right. Okay. Where am I? Oh, we've been going for an hour and 10 minutes, man. Like, how, I know. what do we, Time do we want to do? Uh, I mean, we, if you wanted to take, we, I'm sure we can answer like two questions real quick. Yeah. Maybe okay. So. Cause I've got, yeah, the, I, I, that's all of the kind of paleo Australian stuff. Then there's like Australian contemporary European culture stuff. Which is really oh, interesting, well, important, well, but go, it takes go as long as you want, man. This is this is like if well, if Neil needs do, to go, that's fine, but we can keep going. Okay, how about we do a couple of questions and then I'll just go flat stick into the last bit. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm, there's not too many questions. It's one from Rocket saying, "Do you think that because Australia didn't have hooved herding herbivores compressing carbon in the soils, is, is that part of the reason why our soils are nutrient poor?" Um. Potentially, and this is these are the that's a great question, and that's one of the key questions in this greater discussion. It's often stated that animal agriculture shouldn't has con, um, contemporary or conventional animal agriculture or, or any animal agriculture with hard hooved animals is what I'm trying to get at has no place in Australia because marsupials and other animals in Australia were all soft footed. Right. But I would argue that regardless, I think um, holistic management, um, intensive rotational grazing, holistic rotational grazing definitely has a place in the future of agriculture and land management in Australia because it is regenerative upon the soils. Just because they're Australian soils, just because they're, you know, relatively minerally depleted, just because much of the landscape is, you know, unique, um, doesn't mean that HM holistic rotational grazing is it doesn't work here. It does, and in my opinion, it's actually like the main thing we got to think about because there's so much Australia, there's so much of it that's arid, and if 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 humans left tomorrow. Um, the only thing that would in that I can see that would stop desertification continuing would be to, for, you know, would be a, a healthy trophic system, predator prey rangeland. We've got tons of feral animals now. I mean, apart from the only existing native megafauna, the grey and red kangaroo, we have feral camel, two types of buffalo. You know, water buffalo, bison, not bison, buffalo, um, cow, horse, donkey, pig, goat. Um, and then there's the predators like foxes and cats and whatnot. I don't think they're the issue. In fact, I think they're part of the solution. The problem is the lack of predators. I, I, I've, I'm not being serious when I say this, but, you know, 
if, if I had some kind of sim world game where in, that I was the god emperor of, I would release a hundred breeding pair of lion and hyena and leopard and Komodo dragon and um, on the Australian continent, um, all you know, safe within a simulation and watch what happens. Because I don't think that those those animals, the feral herbivores and hooved animals aren't the problem. The problem is the lack of predators. And that's not a population control issue. It's a behavioral issue. We want to change their behavior so they have a regenerative effect on the landscape. Build soil, stop erosion, stop desertification. And the only animal that has any chance of doing that politically and um, ecologically, because it's here, is the dingo or the wild dog. If every human left Australia tomorrow, it would continue to desertify until dingo populations and now dingo dog hybrids um, re rewilded and reestablished themselves in numbers and quality and quantity to where they were like wolves essentially and pack hunting these large animals. Um, they're the only thing we have. They're the only thing we have. And it's the only animal with even a sliver of, pol of chance politically of being accepted in that role. We're never going to get lion here. It's never going to happen. No one's ever going to allow that or any other pack hunter. The dingo is the only thing we've got. And even that is questioned, you know, like they've just been, they've just been taken off the native fauna list. Agriculturalists are still allowed to shoot dingo. That might not seem like a big deal to a North American because I know they're still shooting. You guys have a way different hunting culture to us. Like you guys still shoot coyote and whatnot, wolf and bear and mountain lion. Um, respectfully to an Australian, that is abhorrent. To go at sport hunting a predator is very strange. Maybe it's just because we don't have any and I, and I understand how important they are to the landscape. But yeah, that's a big discussion. So. The, the dingo is actually the symbol of the Regen Australis project because of its position. Okay. Should we go for it? Go for it. Okay. So then you have uh, European Australians arriving and something, a very, very key important lens through which to look at the greater human story is this it, it, it's like a spectrum. It's like a, a gauge. How deeply connected to the land is any particular individual or culture? Everything rides on that, in my opinion. The health and well being and function of the landscape, and the health and well being and function of the individual and collective human. It, it's the same thing. It's intimately tied. And I believe very strongly that most of the at least mental and emotional pathologies that we see, you know, plaguing the planet at the moment are be at root cause because of a lack of meaningful connection between humanity and the ecology, Gaia, um, and probably many of the physical, um, physiological pathologies as well. So yes, the question is how connected, how, how deep a meaningful connection is there between a people and the land? To me, that's like if, if I was some kind of like, you know, intergalactic anthropological doctor, that would be my kind of like stick your tongue out and say, ah, that would be the first thing I'd do to like diagnose the state of relative health or pathology of a population. How deeply, meaningfully connected are you to the environment? And the thing with most cultures now, I don't know if most is the right word, but of, you know, the global industrialized Western model is, is that it has been exported and continues to spread everywhere. It, it's increasingly less connected. People are increasingly less connected. Um, and I don't demonize the individuals or even the collectives of the, the, that are from those models, you know, North Americans, Australians, Europeans, because within the heritage of those populations, there were, there were traumatic severing 
events of severing the deep identity between the people and the land and no one asks for it and it's not fun and it's deeply traumatic at a racial genetic ethnic level it it it, it and it creates a great disorientation and a lack of self-awareness and a lack of meaning and a lack of story and a lack of self-knowledge um so this slide on the left is a um a print from um i think the 15th century and it was based on roman interpretations of native indigenous pics of the people of scotland and there's you know the people some people say it's not entirely accurate but it gives you some idea of who they the, those people were who like m that's my heritage ultimately i'm western european you know i got a little bit of continental european you know um French, German, Polish, Russian, but then, you know, Irish, Scottish, English. So that's, that is my heritage, right? Look, they're wild. Those people are wild. Um, there's a book called Prittany, P-R-I-T-E-N-I, -E by a woman who's actually a dear friend of mine called Lye De Angelis, and Prittany, and that word Prittany is the root word of Britain, and it means the painted ones because it refers to these people, how fierce they were and how um, what we would call pagan they were and the, the, the story of pre-Roman Britain. So that was a major severing in, in cultural identity in the Western Hemisphere when Rome swept through. I mean, there's been, there's been events of conquering and usurping going back for way longer than that, of course, but Rome was this, the, you know, a widespread broad scale severing of culture of of like pre-abrahamic christian pagan culture so there's that so 2000 years ago that happened to europe and then since then they've been largely christian right and then you know those 2000 odd years you had new european folk cultures develop where you know there was like the, the, the pre-industrial European folk cultures where every little area, every valley, every region had its own, even every village had its own accent, if not dialect, its own form of clothing and dance and art and cheese and dog breed and whatnot. You know, they all had very common threads of, you know, that, that, that run through traditional peoples. Um, but they were also very different. They had diversified um, into what uh, anthropologist Wade Davis calls the ethnosphere. And this, this is what this slide on the right is meant to represent, this old English culture, um, you know, and England had, you know, was on the verge of, um, you know, obviously it was post-agricultural revolution and it was on the verge of the industrial revolution when Australia was, colonized. It was between the first and second industrial revolutions, if I remember. So this is the genesis of the Australian, the European Australia. Um, we were, these people were taken from the streets of their homelands, put, forced, arrested and forced into the hulls of large ships where they were fed brackish water and rotting bread for eight months. And then those who survived found themselves in an alien landscape where they were used as slave labor to build infrastructure for the empire until they died. And that's the genesis. That's not all of the Australian story, but that gives you an idea of, of what it would have been like for these people. Huge cultural trauma, huge cultural severing. So funny things happen that there, there are these bleed throughs of the old culture but the context is completely different. The landscape's completely different and people are dealing with that trauma and then they're in a mode of utter survival, struggling to just survive. And you'd be struggling to survive in any situation, but then to be doing so in a landscape that was so different, added an extra element of like survivalism to it. And Australians are funny, you know, like we're a combination of very easygoing and very laid back 
and understated. But I think that almost is a um, defense against being too emotionally invested in anything because it was we've had to survive. Like early on, it was tough. Living standards became extremely good after that. But the genesis of European Australia, I don't think we've ever dealt with properly. And the 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 settlement systems the the forms of cult, European culture that that formed here afterwards they've never actually formed a sustainable form that because they've never married with the land there's never been a merging with the ecological reality of the continent that's the principal premise of this project is that contemporary Australian cultures are acutely maladjusted to the ecological realities of the continent. We've never had we've never had that great merging occur, which, as I said before, in my humble opinion, is the source of pathology, human pathology. Yeah, Australia has incredible like suicide rate and you know substance abuse and you know, alcoholism and mental health and da 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 da. I, I don't. I'm not trying to paint too gloomy a picture here because Australia is obviously also known as the lucky country. Living standards are incredible. Life is really good. But there is this sub current of this like, it's hard to, there's no real folk culture. There's no real depth and, and substance to, to our way of life. And I think that hurts a lot of people. There is a real soul longing there. Um, this is all just one man's humble opinion. But anyway, so, They've, the, the European Australia has never had to establish a su sustainable um, culture in concert with the land because it's always been propped up by certain things. Like to start off with, it was slave labour, essentially, in, indentured servitude from the first um, convicts. Um, you know, slave labour is a you know, pretty great way to build anything if you don't want to have to pay for it. Um, I mean that tongue in cheek, obviously. Um, then there was welfare from Mother England, you know, just putting resources in to help prop the, col the colony up until it could run on its own. And then, of course, the industries and economies that were developed in Australia and that have been very lucrative for the empire, but they've all been extractive. That's very lucrative because they didn't produce anything. We've never produced anything. We just cut down things and dig holes in, ground, in the ground and sell it to people. And it's all extractive, extractive, extractive. It's take, 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 take. And we haven't learned to live in this environment when we don't have things to just sell that we haven't produced. The same with our agriculture as well. Um, conventional agriculture based on Western European models has been very extractive and very um, detrimental to the Australian environment. And the loss of traditional Aboriginal knowledge, like you got to get this, like in your, if you, everywhere that colonialism occurred, there has been a great loss of traditional Indigenous land practices and culture. It's just, it's just in Australia, it just seems to have been so broad scale and deep, you know, because I think of the chasm between the two cultures, you know what I mean? Like, they're, they're, they're very different cultures, very different cultural types, Western European and Australian Aboriginal. So I just think there wasn't so much room for, for in, um, interaction um, and the, the, the ways in which the colonials viewed the Aboriginals and the way they were treated and how many of them died of, of, of disease and then almost like did genocide, um, it, just, it just disappeared. And because the landscape was so different, again, that it didn't come naturally, you know. It, 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 if you walk out into the, you know, some North American temperate woods in the, in the late summer, you're likely to see some kind of edible something you recognize, like a crab apple or, um, a, you know, a, a cane fruit or a persimmon or a mulberry or an acorn or something, right? Not so in Australia. Very different. Um, again, dark Emian by 
Bruce Pascoe goes into this in great detail. And so this, this added to the lack of appropriate and reliable folk practices. It was just like, okay, so here we are in what's arguably the, the most challenging landscape on the planet for human habitation. And we've just gone and virtually thrown out, erased the, the beyond like the invaluable land stewarding knowledge that is that has been generated over thousands of generations of trial and error it's a hard swallow and i've said this before that uh, that contemporary and european australia and however you want to call it needs to humbly request that indigenous australia share what is left of those practices if they feel like it if it's sanctioned and where they feel if it's appropriate for the sake of um, the whole population of Australia and for the ecology itself. Do we have time for this? Terra nullius, nobody's land. I'll, I'll let you guys look into this because it's, it's, it's a lot, but Terra nullius is um, the, the declaration of Australia as nobody's land and the effect it had on Aboriginal Australia. So the colonial European indi in indigenous relations, there was a rapid demise of indigenous population due to disease, as we've discussed. There was the crown or state had sanctioned genocidal actions. There will be a book coming out, I believe. I don't know the details, but soonish that goes into detail of all the um, mass murders, the um, slaughters on the East Coast. They haven't even started with Western Australia, but Australia has like a dark history with this stuff. I don't know how much it gets around internationally, but it's as bad as it gets. Um, Indigenous Australians were denied citizenship until the 60s, um, and the abrupt cessation of Indigenous land stewarding practices resulted in a dramatic ecological flux. Okay, now the reason I've gone through all of that, apart from the fact that it's true and it needs to be spoken, is that it all of this came together in in a, in a in a in a melange of 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 uh, different points and experiences and they combined to create a dynamic of acute disconnection from the land this is my point the loss of deep indigenous knowledge and practice that was a disconnection from the land that ancient ancient refined those practices of, of deep connection were lost. And a European culture that was disconnected from the land due to a fear of the unknown, it was so different. We still hadn't quite learnt how it really worked. We hadn't melded with it. Sheer survivalism, do whatever we have to do to survive because there's no option, you know, stop your whining, you know, you, you hippie tree hugger. There's a lot of that in Australia. Um, a shame, I should read from, a, a shame in European Australia from the inhumane treatment of the Indigenous, which causes a sense of being unwelcome or undeserving. Um, and the extractive industries and welfare, as we've discussed, which shelter the population from the realities of ecological consequence, all on the most challenging in landscape to humans on the planet. Right, so this is my point. We have arguably the most of all populations anywhere in terms of entire nations or entire continents go. We have as much disconnection from the ecology as it gets on the most challenging landscape on the planet. Right, so you see, you can start to see where I have my concerns. You know, I opened my TEDx talk the other day with Australia once known as the lucky country, modern, prosperous and democratic. And so long as socioeconomic business as usual maintains itself, we will likely continue to experience some of the highest living standards in the world, which is true. It's, it's a funny thing. While socioeconomic business as usual maintains itself, our living standards are incredible. But in the event of, a, of crisis, of one considerable crisis, let alone, uh, you know, a suite of them, which we are facing, things could turn real bad real quick. So this is why the Regen Australis project exists, is to raise 
awareness of that and to foster a deeper discussion on it to get to solutions quickly and to implement them as quick as possible. Um, another interesting thing that cam, comes from all this is this hardline nativist environmentalism. So for years within my ecological and um, environmental training, I was like a con what's called an environmental conservationist. So in Australia, if someone is considered ecologically literate or environmentally interested, they're very likely to err toward that side of things, environmental conservationism. And it kind of, to, to me now, I get a really almost resentful, misanthropic vibe from that. And there seems to be this subtext of um, the best, you know, white man, we have stuffed up so hard, we are so undeserving that the best thing that can be done for the environment is just to keep humans out of it. Don't go in there, lock them out and, and except where, you know, where if we spray a bit of glyphosate to kill off non-native weeds every now and then, or to put, to poison non-native animals. And then other than that, it's as if the human, the, the relationship between contemporary Australia and the land has to come through the state. It's very much the case here. There is this not this, there isn't a real sense of like um, stewardship of the land, direct stewardship or direct connection with the land, um, direct relationship with the land. It, it, it's more like you have to go through to do anything. You have to first go through the appropriate bodies and it, it's all sanctioned and uh, by the state. I know that's all very vague, but I do feel that. And yeah, so this hardline nativist environmentalism is just like lock people, keep people out of it. Um, and you can even see it through a lot of the natural resource management groups where, um, you know, a lot of the grants they'll give you is just to, to fence an area off and plant trees and walk away from it. You're not allowed to do anything with it ever again. So all of this in turn, all of this made for a more acute and swift ecological degradation. Um, in a very short amount of time, the human, you know, the European or contemporary populations of Australia could see an acute change in the environment. You know, grandfather could tell you things about the farm that were very different to how you see it, you know, whether it's species of marsupial or the way that the hydrology went or the fact that we, you know, the, the paddock keeps growing rocks. Um, you know, it's not uncommon now to see lots of dead old trees in, in fields and, and along riverways in Australia that aren't regenerating. Um, yeah, and, and it's been suggested that this is why all of these things came together to create ripe ground for progressive solutions, right? So it was kind of like, it was the perfect scenario for minds like Yeoman's and Doherty and Mollison and Holmgren to actually to actually go, hang on a minute, something is up. Because usually, you know, in cultural ecology and cultural forms are slow to change and move. And that's the, the thing with the, the scale of a human lifetime. The zeitgeist is ver is almost invisible because relative to our lifetime and relative to the our scale of perception, it, it, it's invisible because it's so big. But when there is rapid and acute change, that's when an individual can actually go, oh, hang on a minute. And that's what I argue has happened here. First with uh, Yeomans, with Keyline, which is foundational to the Regen Ag movement. I consider it the foundation. That's an Australian born development. Um, the Rebrarians platform by um, Doherty's work, which is obviously based on Keyline, but does add, it, it has its own merits and, and its own um, um, additions. That's Australian. Permaculture, devised, developed by Holmgren and Mollison in the 70s, that's Australian. Um, the only other one that I consider in this like foundational pillar of Regen Ag is uh, holistic management. That's, of course, we know 
Savory is Southern African, he's Zimbabwean. But notice how similar um, the, the cultural dynamics of those regions were. I'm just gonna turn my Facebook off. Ah, speaking of holistic management, that little message was Brian Welberg, holistic management trainer in Australia. Um, yes, so of all the places around the world where there were similar cultural and ecological dynamics, it was in Southern Africa. You know, there really isn't anywhere like Australia, but if you had to point to another place around the world which has the most similar ecology, it would be Southern Africa, in my opinion. Obviously, there's major differences, largely with the types of large animals. And the and culturally, it is most similar. In, you know, it was a Europe, it has a deep indigenous history with a relatively recent European colonial history and um, Savory um, was the, you know, grew up in that English Zimbabwean culture. And um, for similar reasons, I think, paid attention to similar things and holistic management was born. Um, so solutions very quickly, and I'm going to rush through this, this is right at the end. So the solutions, apart from those Regen Ag studies that we just discussed, and anyone who has dipped a toe into any of these knows that any sub point of any point within any of these different modalities we could talk about forever. They're super complex, but together, to me, they form the basis of the the data and data analysis and and um, system design um, modalities of all of the regen ag movement around the world. Uh, on top of that, I think there's room for the um, fleshing out and systematizing and formatting of what we call the sibling regions project, which is essentially a study into climatic analog and bioregionalism, where we, um, what, what we want to do, we propose that in, instead of twinning cities and towns, and you're probably aware that around the world, towns and cities and whatnot are twinned with other towns and cities, other places around the world. And to date, it's been usually quite arbitrary political and economic reasons as to who's twinned with who. So we suggest that cities and settlements are twinned around the world with their climatic analogues. And you know where it's climatically analogous and culturally appropriate to do so, um, to foster and generate uh, an, an exchange between those people, a beneficial cultural and agricultural agricultural exchange, where we can exchange um, plant and animal varieties with the appropriate quarantining and whatnot, and the strategies and technologies and 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 even just ritual and and ceremony. Perhaps it doesn't have to be hard nuts and bolts survival stuff. It can be very much um, ethno-cultural as well. And we actually catalog, or we describe and format the ways in which that would, would happen. How do you make a study of coming to decide who you twin with who? Um, and then the bioregionalism aspect of that, of, of course, is governing or administrating an area based on the ecological realities of that region and and you know further decentralization of power away from this you know aim to further centralize power that we see you know and it's not working i mean look at everything with the united before it is you know unfortunately it's not working look at the eu you know, these we, people people want to be autonomous. People want to make decisions for themselves, and it's understandable because what would someone in Brussels know about life on the land in Sicily? What would someone in Washington know about life on the land in Tennessee? You know, so um, where I'm, we I am all for bioregional administration. Um, energy, I'll just say that another issue with Australia is that Australia only stores its petroleum products on mass on site for like maybe 10 to two, 10 days to two weeks worth of 
fuel and it's all held offshore at any given time. So in the event of a disruption to that, it'd be very, very uh, bad. And the future, um, the projected kind of political um, future of Australia economically and agriculturally is to grow a whole lot of food, but for Asia. Um, I'm not even going to go into why I think that's not a great idea. Um, I'll let you figure it out for yourself. Um, I'm going to skip forward now to call it the end. Oh, this, here's another trip on Dehesa. One of the things that I love and is very dear to my heart is the Dehesa Australis project, which is, you know, comes in the sibling regions project because it is a, it's an, it's an eco agricultural application that we've deemed very applicable and um, um, it's a beautiful thing, the Dehesa. Um, I think I will leave it there. Like I just could go on and on forever, but I'll leave it there, guys. Do you want to? Do we want to do some questions, or are we way over the mark? No, oh, you're good, man. Of course, like I, I like staying on as long as people have questions and want to hear about this. You know, like Elaine will go on for three hours about soil biology, and people will still be on. I, okay. I think this is such a deep topic that man, you could rail on for hours, like on any facet of it, you know, our yeah. cultural, just it alienation all unfolds endlessly. Yeah. yeah. And those are, those books are really great intro to it. I mean, they're, they're really mind blowing. It's like, you know, the foods that the aboriginals had and, and people don't even consider eating those foods. And the land management practices, this the the way that sheeps just graze the shit out of all of the soils and left nothing but bare, you know, bare dirt. Yeah, they they did, they do. Um, and again, it, it it's a complex discussion, but it's not. Again, they're not the problem so much as it's the it's the management that's the issue. Sure. But in a in a wilder sense, it's the lack of predators that are the issue. Um, but it's it, it's it's in Australia, it's way more politically um, spicy because you know in in Africa or Europe or Asia or North America or South America, it's not such a big issue because pre-colonial the pre-colonial ecology looked like that in Australia. The environmentalists here are, are so hell bent on on the on making Australia look like it did before European settlement that it's not so easy to argue for th these hooved animals, which I believe actually are part of the answer. It's just we've got to think about the predation side of thing. Yeah, because you look you like sorry, go on. Well, I'm saying in in the you almost have that that counter. You know, you have the the nature conservancy environmentalism where it's like, yeah, destroy all non-natives, keep away from humans, and then, you know, it'll solve itself. We know that's led to desertification, but there's also the kind of introduced rewilding where you put in proxy species and yeah. we see the results from bison there, but. Yes, but the. Nice yeah, and and, and re rewilding is, is really, really incredibly interesting and valid i think it's a, that that subject that what like rewilding and plasticine rewilding is super interesting and super valid and i think it'll be part of the greater discussion going forth you know fast forward to the year 2500 i think there will be lion and elephant in europe and yeah. hippopotamus <laughs> and stuff i just think there will be um, well that that just that keeps me going because it's like i don't think there's any more exciting world than while everything's degrading, the thought that you could put camels in the United States, you could put elephants and lions and have them just roaming around. I think that would it's it'd be a world is, worth living in. You know, it is exciting, and I think we long for that kind of world. And um, yeah, George Monbiot, like him or not, he he speaks about that. How much more exciting a world it would be. And this is an interesting thing because it, it actually in from what I see in environmentalism, there's the old school, which is kind of speciesist, which say they kind of take a Polaroid snapshot of a time, of a place at, at a time in history, and they say, 
that's how it's meant to look. And we need to get it as close to that as possible with all this, the right species in the right place. And if those species don't exist anymore, well, that's a huge tragedy as it is, but we can't remedy that then, like done, closed book. Mm -hmm. Then there's, there's this growing appreciation for like functionality, ecological function, which are these broader rules and laws of nature and that they are far more important it's far more important to have a to foster ecological function than it is to to, to insist on any particular species filling a niche. Um, and once that, I think once that, and I'm not I'm not saying that a species isn't a very valuable thing. It, absolutely, and we should do everything possible to, you know, stop the extinction of any species. And and where there is relatively pristine environment around the world, yes, let's conserve it. However, we are now dealing with so much area of the planet that doesn't look the way it looked, you name it, 200 years ago, 2000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, that, that there is a lot of room to, to argue that, that the introduction of these proxy species, particularly the megafauna, is a very very valuable thing in the long run. The thing is that in in Australia, and I hope people have a greater appreciation for this now, the political discussion is so much more complex. We can't just it's going to take so much longer for anyone to agree that the the wild ungulates here, the camel, the donkey, the horse, the pig, da 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 da, are actually potentially very beneficial. It's just a problem that there's no predators. It's that. It's like just one more challenge and anomaly in the story of Australia, you know? So that, that's how I see it. It's like Australia is this strange player where the rules are all bent and we have to do a bit more thinking. Yeah. Awesome. Well, man, I, I'm sure I got a bajillion more questions too because, man, I. I mean, like I met Byron in 2012 at the Koanga Institute, or I think I met you a little bit before that, but you were the food forest yeah. like uh, director there. And I was like, man, yeah. this guy knows his stuff on all things related to plants. And it's just, you, you think very deep about all these subjects. And I know it's, it's like when you think deep, it's easy to get like, uh, feel like things are crazy or hopeless and crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, we get him in. Okay, but, how, uh, but let's open it up with some questions. I know people have been waiting a long time. So if you had a question before that you asked maybe an hour ago, type it in again so that way we Byron can get it to you. So here's one from Hannah, Hannah Eckberg, creator of Permaculture Magazine North America. Uh, so she's saying there's analog forestry. Is there a word for analog animal introduction? That's pretty good. Good question. Yeah, I, I think it, it would come under the uh, the rewilding banner. Um, I, I've yeah. I mean, the, this like I said at the beginning, I have a great appreciation for when an an idea comes through to maturation, and there's enough people who have been observing it for long enough that you can start actually formatting that idea, systematizing it. Um, that's a very valuable place to be. Um, rewilding is getting there, right? So you've got like the Rewilding Europe project and they do an incredible, if you go to my website, oaktreedesigns.com.au and then go to articles, no, it's called media. There's an article called Dehesa Australis. And in that article, there's a bunch of links and one of them is to the Spanish and Portuguese rewilding projects. Um, and they're just brilliant. They're, they're incredible. Um, but that, that movement is, is not quite embryonic, but it's young enough for it to have not been really, they're still learning. It's not quite formatted yet. And so I don't know what terms are used like with the analog animal stuff, but uh, it'll be, it'll, it'll, it'll have a name soon enough, no doubt. Yeah, so they were doing a Pleistocene park. I, I got to go to the Romania rewilding project. That was cool. We saw wood bison and uh, bears in Romania, and that that yeah. was that was super cool. So B Winfield's asking, Byron, hey, do you have any notion? 
you have any notion how we might get Australians to realize how important eating cell grazed organic meat is for the landscape, climate change, and human health? So I without would. HM, I see Western Australia slipping into the Middle East style desert very quickly. Um, hello, B. 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 And I did our um, a PDC together in 20, 2008, I think. Um, but the, yeah, this is this is super important, and this is one of the things I hope to speak to Darren Doherty about. I think regenerative agriculture in general needs a marketing campaign. I think that people don't realise how much work has been done. I don't think they realise how positive and win-win the solutions are that it, that it offers. I don't think people realise that it's not just some hippie fluff, you know, flash in the pan kind of passing fad. Um, there is a book that's been written by an Australian guy called Charles Massey. Um, it's like the best book on regenerative agriculture that you know, it's that I certainly Australian. It's called The Call of the Reed Warbler. And that's been that's that's kind of taken the the um marketing or the the, the face of Regen Ag out a bit more into the public. And I've noticed now that like the West Australian Minister for Agriculture and, and the natural resource management groups are starting to take all this on board, which is very positive. As for holistic management principles in particular, I agree with you, B. Look, there is so much of Australia that, in my opinion, will continue to desertify so long as that predator prey rangeland relationship is so heavily atrophied. We we can't go into the real nuts and bolts of it now for those who don't understand But Basically, as I mentioned before, in a brittle environment, if you don't have large grazing herds of herbivores and the predators that prey upon them, that land will desertify. And much of Australia is brittle. We saw before a third is fully arid, a third is semi-arid, and then the other third is a combination of temperate Mediterranean, subtropical and tropical. Uh, much of that is brittle. So, yeah, I agree. Like I said before, if if every human left if every human left the Australia yesterday, it would still continue to desertify. If every human and every animal that European humans had released here left the Australian continent tomorrow, it would continue to desertify and it would do so quicker than if those animals were here. The issue is the lack of predators. Now that's that's on a broad scale, like nature doing its own thing kind of level, that we need those dingoes and wild dogs to pack hunt, not only the kangaroos, but those in, in introduced ungulates. But the, where, where humans can do their bit is with the holistic rotational grazing. Um, and then, of course, that means that you are regenerating brittle rangelands, turning it, stopping desertification, but you're also producing high quality food in a way that is ethical, as ethical as it gets in terms of um, animals in agriculture. So it's win, win, win. The problem is, amongst many, is that this, this, there is this, membrane in the Australian mind we have to get through. I keep going back to this. It's, it's, it's tougher than in Europe and Africa and the Americas to get this through culturally and politically because we perceive hooved animals as bad because they're not native and we have an extra nativist headspace here. You know, like there's a station in WA, I think it's called, what is it, Woolama Station? I should know the name of it. And I really respect what they did. But they had, you know, they're like these ranches in WA. They're like millions of hectares or acres. And they took all their stock animals off it, all their sheep and cattle. And there was an incredible resurgence of native flora, which is awesome. It's great. And that's, you know, another, that's another feather in the cap of the anti-animal agriculture, anti-hooved animal camp, right? 
But what I think may occur in that landscape, it's been like 10 years now. And oh, you there? It looked like it dropped out. You hear me? I just turned off your screen share because it was just oh, on okay. your desktop. Okay, so. cool. That's cool. So what I think might happen with this station in Western Australia is they've taken off the animals that were eating everything down to the ground and not giving it time to recover. And now they're resting the land in holistic management nomenclature. They're, they're allowing the land to rest and recover. And we're seeing recovery now. But without mosaic disturbance from large animals, once in a while, and I don't know how long that is, every year, every two years, every five, every 10, every 20, I don't know. It's all about the particular, the particulars of the, that environmental context. I still think you need strong strategic beneficial disturbance from large animals, which can be provided by grazing herbivores. So I think there's the recovery period where everything looks amazing and all these plants and birds and stuff come back and that's awesome. But it would, it'll start slowly degrading again in a different, Con dynamic without um, mosaic disturbance patterns from grazing herbivores. So basically to answer your question B, yeah, I think it's super important. I don't know how to get the answer out there. Um, if I had, if I could put my order form into God for my dream job, what I want to do, I don't want to design and consult so much or even teach. I love all those things, but what I want to do is make documentaries about this. Like we, people need to see this, like high quality, treating the audience like they're intelligent, actually talking about the ecology as if they want to know some finer details, looking at the, the new systems like holistic management and what, what have you, key line, that kind of thing. And then also highlighting the old traditional systems of the world um, for one, just because it'd be good viewing and people want to see it, but actually two as like a, you know, as prosper, prosperity, uh, posterity for humanity to make a good thorough documentation of the Dehesa, the Shinampa, um, you know, it goes on and on. These, these, the, those Hawaiian systems, I forget what they're called. Um, you know, the, the, there's those vast, beautiful wetland rice paddy systems of China, you know, all these beautiful old traditional agricultural systems, they need to be um, marketed and documented. That's awesome, man. <clears throat> I mean, it's, I mean, Javin, he, he had an idea for Javin Bernankovich about a fire documentary and he didn't win the vote, but they still gave him $50,000 to do it. So now he has got 50 K to make his fire documentary, which wow. is pretty, yeah. Pretty cool. I so, voted for that. Javin's an extremely good human being. Yeah, he's cool. So there's a few questions here. I know like there's you know Glenn and and Robert and Ruth and Don. We'll get to these. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll stick around as long as need be. So Glenn's asking the original paintings when Europeans arrived show very fertile grasslands similar to the prairies in the American Midwest. Carbon yeah. levels in Australia were measured in the high teens soon after being colonized. So the first question right. is, how quickly do you think carbon levels were depleted through European farming practices? And second is, how quickly could these levels be improved through regenerative practices? Um, thanks, for, thanks for that. I'd like the data on those carbon levels. Um, how fast were they depleted? I don't know. Not long, really. Like geologically speaking, we're talking a couple of hundred years max like a few generations and how long will it take to recover? Well, as long as it takes um, good holistic rotational grazing to become viable, you know, so that's a matter of um, advocating for it, educating people on it and incentivizing land holders and pastoralists to practice in that way. Uh, again, we need, people, we need the political will and the social will to do it. We just need people to know it's an option, you know, policy makers and, you know, grant writers and um, all of that. Um, I don't know how long it would take to get back to like high teen carbon levels in the soil using 
HM practices? I don't know that. Um, I'll ask that particular question because again, I want to have this discussion with Darren in a really kind of like focused way. So, um, and that's one of the questions I actually have, I've got, because of this whole Australian soil issue, what was the carbon level? Was it high? Um, is, is the, are the poor soils due just to being old and geriatric? Or was there something to do with the fact that the megafauna died off and the land was resting to death and all of that? To, I'd like to get a clearer idea on it myself. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Oh, one last thing for everybody still watching. You're going to get a replay. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? But uh, next questions from Don Woodcock saying, Byron, can you describe some of the benefits and interactions of the proposed DeHesa and how these can be promoted to create change? Okay. Yeah. So there's a whole suite of extra environmental benefits. And hello, Don. Don um, is one of these mega brains he's from southwestern australia the wheat belt um in fact i'm going to show you guys a thing don is from the wheat belt and he knows more about the the greater story of southwestern australia at least than just about anyone i know in terms of the long form geology and how the place formed and the the ecology and the the forestry and whatnot but so see this area here this is south the tip of southwestern australia it's known as the wheat belt and basically this dark green is the existing woodlands and that's all regrowth from forestry that was logged this is the swan coastal plain and that's virtually all it, if not suburb it's like just human settlement of one type or another with some farmland in there, like grazing. Um, all of this. Yeah, Byron, might, uh, yeah. we're not seeing your screen. Do you want me to share your screen? Oh, yeah, man. Sorry, please. Yep, yeah, yep, yep. that was because okay. you're mentioning stuff. That's cool. That's cool. Tell me when it, when it's back. You got it. Let me. Okay, you're the presenter now. Oof. Okay, thank you, mate. So, so um, where is it? Here. No, go away. This dark green is woodland. That's regrowth forest from when it was all logged. Um, and this light green to brown here, that is a, that's pretty much, that was all woodland that has been logged to create farmland for sheep and wheat. And it's known as the wheat belt. And Don, Don is my go-to guy for information on the wheat belt and all things related. Um, the Dehesa Australis project, it, 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 it looks at one, the fact that we are a, a Mediterranean climate region, which basically means we have hot, dry summers or warm, dry summers and relatively mild, cool, wet winters with winter rainfall, like the Mediterranean basin, like Southwest, um, South Africa, like California, and like Chile, parts of Chile. And there are other little areas dotted around the world, but they're the main ones. And in, in these regions, savanna is a very common biome where you have a relatively intact um, trophic level uh, levels, you know, predators, prey, grazers, whatnot. You know, that, those interactions often form savanna. You know, so things aren't just pure grassland, but because of the animals, it doesn't go back to thick woodland, it's savanna, right? A lot of this was kind of like, where it was moister, you have thicker forest, but as you push up into the drier desert areas, it was dry sclerophyll woodland and savanna and some grasslands. Okay, so we know savanna is a winning biome type. Now, we can continue to create food here, but why don't we return it to savannah? But why don't we use species that, like we met, I mentioned before, um, let, let's, let's honor and, and foster uh, ecological function. So we want these broader, more foundational ecological functions to be as strong as possible. 
regardless of the species, right? And if we if we're going to take the wheat belt, which is one of the world's greatest, more unfortunate and and severe deforestation events, and we're going to try to turn it back into like grow more trees there, then why don't we do so instead of just using endemic species? Why don't we use species that will be um, advantageous to agricultural production? Because those of us who've studied these things know that we can have great economically viable, you know, animal ethically appropriate um, agricultural production while simultaneously regenerating the landscape. So let's do it. Let's plant trees back here in this whole area, but let's use species that are, are um, advantageous to our to regenerative agriculture. And the dehesa is the perfect analog. So the, the savanna trees would be a combination of different species of oak, um, you know, and those species would change depending on the brittleness and the rainfall and the soil types. But, um, you know, down here where it's moister, you could have deciduous oaks like the English oak or Quercus bicolor or Quercus albor or Quercus macrocarpa or good North American deciduous oaks with high quality acorns. And then as it dries out, you can start having the, the, the dry land um, evergreen oaks from Spain that are in the dehesa itself, the Quercus suba and the Quercus ilex. Um, and, man, you know, there's many others as well. There's heaps of dry land Mexican oak varieties that I would love to look into, research the live oak varieties. Um, and even you could have chestnut down here where it's moister. And then pushing out where it's really dry, you could start introducing things like carob and even some completely outrageous, crazy people have suggested mes mesquite and things like that. So that's a huge job to establish that over this kind of area. But you have this whole suite of extra environmental benefits like um, extra shade, um, minimized evaporation from the wind being slowed down, more shelter for animals, whether it's shelter from wind, shelter from the sun, because there's more options for, for, um, for them to camp under. They don't camp under just one tree, which, you know, causes the camping erosion and they don't just like defecate and poo under the one tree and cause a toxicity and kill it. It's spread out. Um, those trees create habitat for, you know, reptiles, mammals, birds. Um, geez, what else? Uh, just the trans evaporation. The, you know, there is more transpiration and evaporation, which creates a moister environment, which creates a cooler environment, which means that there's more likelihood for rainfall. Um, it goes on and on and on. Aesthetically, it's just far more pleasing. It makes for a more beautiful environment it pretty much mitigates all of the environmental extremes it um the hots are cooler the colds are warmer the winds are slower um it goes on and on um and then of course the the around here in this part of the world we have what's called the autumn feed gap so after summer you know there's no rains and it's hot and dry and then before the first rains of autumn, and indeed even for a while after the first rains, things are seriously sparse. And that's our dormant season where pasture isn't growing, grass isn't photosynthesized, like it's just too hot and too dry. It's brittle, right? So it's right in that time of the year that all the plants, the trees that I mentioned before, drop their fruits, which are big, heavy, starchy, oily, protein-filled nuts and pods, you know. Oaks drop their acorns, carobs drop their pods, gladitia drop their pods, chestnut drop their nuts, mesquite, I believe. I could be wrong with mesquite, but that they drop their pods that time of year. So right when the time of year where the pasture is, is producing at least, these trees are offering up a, a, a very, very substantial supplementary feed for the stock animals. Now it is supplementary. Their main feed will always be the pasture, but it's a very, very welcome um, supplement right at the right time of year. And then of course, if we do things beforehand, if before any of that happens, we start with the foundations and we look at the 
the context of the, the job. You know, we look at the climate of the area. We look at the, um, as per the agrarians platform, the, the meteorological climate. We look at the mental climate, the demography and psychography of the people, um, the budget, you know, the time frame. Then, then, then we move on to the geography and we look at the soil and the topography and we map out the area on key, based on key line, which is absolutely invaluable for like maximizing water efficiency in the area. And then we decide what goes where, you know, the, the water harvesting, the roads, the forestry. And um, so all of that combined, plus subsoil plowing where necessary, plus holistic rotational grazing, um, in, not just of stock, larger stock animals like cattle and sheep, but you know, also meat birds and egg layers and, and whatnot, the whole bit. As men, you know, bring as much to the party as possible. You, it's it really you get the vision, and this is the vision where you put it all together. And those of us who have studied this long enough, when the pennies start dropping and the proof is in the pudding from you know the data and the feedback, we realise that this can be done. And you see the types of systems and the world we could create. I mean, it's super exciting. It's it's so beautiful and invigorating. And I would love to see this part of the world returned to something like that because as Don knows and has spoken to me about, there were wetlands throughout here. All the Southwestern Australia was famous for savanna and wetlands. There's the hills that run down here, but this plain and much through what's now the wheat belt was savanna and wetlands, these beautiful large chains of ponds and what were called swamps. Um, you can still see it now at the end of the wet season in that part of the world. There are gullies and areas where, where there's typhus and juncus reeds growing and whatnot. But um, yeah, you know, the political and social will and the resources that follow is what's stopping us now. We need a marketing campaign. People need to know. We need some thing, a TV show, I, I don't know what, but when people realize when they're told in a way that they can understand what these what these design modalities mean, what regenerative agriculture means and what it can do, that it's real uh, and that we really just need will and resources to help that transition smoothly occur, then you know then we'll start seeing a bigger move. Because other than that, without the advocacy of the greater population, it, it, it's a slow plodding movement of only those practitioners that can somehow make it viable, economically viable. And some have done a great job at it and others find it very difficult despite their best efforts and intelligence. Um, yeah, so we need to make a noise about this stuff in a very level headed way. We need to show people that there, it, it's not just a, a pipe dream. And it's not just, you know, permaculture has a bit of a hippie, fluffy um, kind of reputation. And I can understand why, but I'll defend it to the death. I'll defend that, you know, when you reduce permaculture down to its original design modality thinking, then it's absolutely invaluable. And we need people to know that the greater regenerative agricultural movement is the real thing and that it's mature and intelligent and it's insightful and foresightful and we run a ruler over things and we really think about it. Um, so yeah, I'll be taking donations if anyone wants to throw money at me. <laughs> I'll go make that documentary. $10,000. Well, it's gotta be at least as interesting as The Bachelor Australia. Yeah, man, that ended last night. It was amazing, the ending, it blew me away. <laughs> Not oh, of guess. What okay, so uh, I think this is probably the last question. Why don't we close with it? This is a uh, Ruth Gale two part question. She's sure. saying, Marketing Australia, do you know of the land to market? Do you know of the land to market Australia? And the second question is, What do you say the growing belief in veganism being the answer to all things environment? The, okay, the first question the growing land the, to market. Um, it would have been this. 
it would have been Yobani, which was one of the properties designed and developed by PA Yeomans using key line principles, right? So this is a beautiful landscape, key line principles, maximizing of water efficiency, maximizing of, you know, look at it, it's gorgeous. Um, from there, you take that and using the Agrarians platform, you continue to design it in a very, very strategic and intelligent way. You put the roads in, you, then you decide where the forestry is going and where the buildings are going and where the fencing is going. And after a while, you have a very, very highly productive, highly functional and extremely beautiful environment that not only provides humanity with all of its needs, food, fiber, shelter, water, what have you, but simultaneously regenerates ecological function in the meantime. That would have been the go-to, but unfortunately, where's my thingy, there's too many windows open. It's been, it was sold to developers and it's now going to be suburb and not the productive regenerative agricultural property it should have been. It should have been made heritage listed and then they should have given someone like Darren Doherty, who I believe is the uh, curator of the Keyline archives and is very much you know, considered the, um, the protege of, of, of uh, Yeomans, although they didn't meet, he, to, you know, given the job to curate it and develop it further with a, with a budget to do so, a healthy, um, you know, generous budget. But unfortunately, we don't live in a, a time or a place where these things are recognised as being important. And this will be considered an absolute travesty in the future. So I don't know what place we have as like the showcase, and that's the, the problem. I don't know if there is a one, there isn't one yet that has pulled it all together. And this is why it's so god damn frustrating you know there's so much bloody resource and money and liquid flying around the planet being invested into absolutely useless disposable hyper convenient shit when we still don't have the like flagship project to actually show people that look, look this is happening this can be done because the only people doing it are these kind of mom and pop you know, off their, you know, off their own backs, projects, you know, slog, not only do they have to face the eco same economic realities of everyone else in the world, but they have to fight against the cultural current, you know, they're, they're bloody saints, the people who do this, it drives me nuts, you know, I don't know, I don't know what goes on in the heads of politicians and policy makers and um, advisors and whatnot, but Jesus Christ, my God, I, you know, <laughs> when I die and go to heaven to the pearly gates or at some point in the future where they bring my cryogenically frozen head back, <laughs> like I think to, to be a, a, a politician or a policy maker, to be considered a person of influence in the early 20th, 21st century will be, you know, be such an appalling thing. It'll be like a derogatory term because the, 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 the usual um those usual positions of of change makers whether the power whether it be resources or policy that they where they lay that power lays it's just there's nothing coming from it the 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 game changes you know the uh the innovators are so far ahead of the regulators but the second question was veganism wasn't it and uh, veganism Look, I was and a I guess I guess an attachment question is is one Rocket's asking. Uh, yeah. First one's about veganism, and then Rocket's asking another question about wouldn't it be better to try to focus on native foods more so suited to Australian soils? I think that's an aspect. That's a huge aspect. I mean, look, I I think when I'm emperor, and they come to me and ask what how we're going to play this game, emperor it, Byron. It's, an, it's an entire subset of study in the solutions category of, like I said before, humbly requesting as much knowledge as we can from the indigenous community 
and then like a serious um, investigation into the ethnobotanical application of Australian plants. Uh, because now, currently we've got you got the macadamia, and then there's like native Australian citrus, and there is a huge um, interest, growing interest in Australian bush foods, but it's kind of from a like novelty gourmet angle, and that's great. I'm not critiquing that. It's just when it comes to like food that's going to sustain a, a omnivorous mammal, like a human, we need to look at staple foods as well you know, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and there's, that's tricky. So look- What about the market thing, for like kangaroo meat and- Sure, absolutely. It, it, we, all of the above, but I just don't think, I don't think it's the option. And this is, a, this is I write about this in the Regen Australis. Who are we? What is Australia now? Well, we need to do a thorough study of what it was and who they were, and that's changed. And how has it changed? So what is Australia now? Well, it's largely uh, a, a European, a ex-European or European colonial population. There is an indigenous population. There are others, there's Asian, a big Asian population and Indian and uh, Southern European and, uh, there's a Muslim population, yes, all those things. And the cultural gap between current contemporary European-ish Australian culture and pre-colonial Aboriginal culture is huge. And there's room to move in there. And I keep saying the Aboriginal, the Indigenous knowledge and practices is one major component in the solutions category, if you will but it's not the be all and end all. It's gonna be a hybrid. If we could click our fingers and fast forward to a 500 years in the future to some idealist, idealistic end result, you know, or climax state Australian eco agriculture, then it'll be this hybrid of all of the above. It'll be a recognition of what the Australian ecology actually is. It'll be a recognition of what the Aboriginal indigenous land practices and relationship was and the Australian food plants, uh, animals, you know, kangaroos and whatnot, but then also more contemporary or, you know, European style, stop yawning. Um, <laughs> like, you know, holistic management, da 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 da. I think these things have a huge part to play. Holistic management, holistic rotational grazing has a huge part to play in the future of. Australian eco agriculture. Um, so yes, that's one aspect: the Australian foods um, to veganism. I was a vegetarian for a number of years and a pretty strict one, like pushing on vegan. And um, so I appreciate the motivations because I was motivated by ethics. You know, I loved animal products, but it was an ethical issue for me. And it was in my twenties, and many people in their twenties become very um, socio-politically and ethically motivated and quite myopic actually and and it's a it's we all go through it in fact humanity is going through it now you know look at the we got we're in a juvenile um protesting you know yeah, bring it's, down it's really see it. especially the bay area veganism is is exploding it's like you know the new like get your lab grown beet and your impossible burger right. and all this shit. And you know, it's yeah. you look at the ingredients like genetically modified wheat gluten and Yes. So you, I can appreciate I appreciate the ethic. Yeah. But and I, there was a show on TV in Australia the other day on Catalyst and it was the future of food in Australia. And I didn't mention it in my TED talk, I wish I had. But it was like future of food in Australia. And it was all lab grown meat and um, <laughs> you know industrial scale hydroponic tomatoes and whatnot and very little reference to land the stewarding future. yeah the future right and i noticed that more than anywhere in the world that i've seen i've not been to san francisco i'd love to um uh la is as is as kind of like hip progressive foodie nutrition as it gets like it is it's yeah, incredible yeah. man like 
but and that's great you know these are all signs of a movement forward they're all positive but i mean apart from the kind of nauseating arrogance that comes with a lot of that there isn't an appreciation for the regenerative eco agricultural aspect like yeah it's good for you yeah it's full of nutrients you, you know great you are mineralizing and hydrating and detoxing and that's hooray for your body however back behind the scenes there is there is an, an ecology happening and i often say in region australis one of the subtitles is or an axiom that i repeat over and over again is that ecology is the foundation of agriculture agriculture is the foundation of culture and in that context like agriculture i use it to mean the human ecology interface not just agriculture you know as in like the agricultural revolution but i mean all of the many and varied ways in which human populations interface with the environment to provide themselves with all their needs. So ecology is the foundation of agriculture. Agriculture is the foundation of culture. Cult human culture is an ecological enterprise and we've forgotten it. We have that severed, traumatic severing from a deep connection, meaningful connection to land. We need, again, to market that. And veganism, man, that whole, like you, we called it like impossible burgers and what was it like a, you know, they don't, yeah, yeah, look, you know, you know, you, you would have seen it, Riley. There's been times when I've, like on Facebook, I've said, okay, dear vegan permaculturalists, I respectfully come to you asking for you to please explain to me the eco-agricultural just how do you justify it eco agriculturally? And I haven't seen that done. Well, I, I remember yeah. staying with okay. this, this couple, Chris and Lynn in Montana, were probably the best natural builders I have ever met in my life. They made a straw bale cob, uh, no, it was, it was, yeah, straw bale cordwood retreat center that could support 50 people totally off grid. And yet they were vegan and they had to get all their food there. And, you know, they had to build, a giant wall to keep the deer, the, all the deer out from, you know, browsing all their kale. And they're like, no, we don't want any dogs, not gonna eat any meat, even though you're in Montana and kind of the only way to really sustain yourself there would be to eat a little bit of meat. Okay. Yeah, look, to me, it, it comes back to, I, I actually believe, and this is, I probably shouldn't even mention it, but I think fast forward long enough, if humanity moves, continuing in a, in a trajectory of sophistication and maturation and sensitivity and wisdom, I could see us moving toward a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, but that's way down the track. And we are in an intermediate period right now. We are, we're in the transition period of ever. Like I don't, then I can't, we're in a massive revolution right now. You know, there's the, the cognitive revolution where human cultural forms, you know, modernized. And then there was the agricultural revolution. There was the first and second industrial revolution. There was the world wars. There was the um, information revolution. Whatever's going on now is it. We are, this is the shit storm. Like there won't be another chaotic node dynamic like this for a long time we're in the middle of it we're not even in the middle of it it's barely started we're a decade two into the real like storm of it and it's going to keep going for a long time it will be you know it'll be generations yet until humanity can take a deep breath and say oh wow we're in a stable sustainable or regenerative form of culture cool like we've got ages to go my point is that Predation and carnivory are just realities. It's a reality, you know? It sucks that lions eat baby zebras, but it happens, you know? Predation is a reality. And hum some humans can be predatory, you know? It's a reality. So there's that. There's no such thing as a vegan or vegetarian ecosystem. And I use nature as a model. That's what I do. That's what regenerative agriculturalists do. Second to that, the question is this, 
do animals suffer? Can they suffer? Yes, they can suffer. Okay. As soon as we've established that, and I don't care for the like the accusation of anthropomorphizing them and saying they don't really suffer, they're not conscious. That's just how we think. It's like no, they fucking suffer. And even if they, if even if it, it could be proven objectively that they don't, I'm going to assume they do in case they do. So then it's okay, okay, they do suffer. Then there's an ethical um, imperative that we minimize that suffering. Regenerative agricultural practices minimize animal suffering or any animal ethical issue you could throw at it, minimize it to the point where it's virtually null. I mean, think about a cow in a holistic, in a good, proper, well-run, well-established holistic rotational grazing system under oak trees and, you know, all of that. And that, you know, that's an amazing life ethically for an animal. You know, there is one bad day and that day isn't, doesn't have to be as bad if we do things like, and I'm talking about the culling of them. If we do things like um, mobile, abattoirs and stun guns and all of this stuff like it's a reality omnivory carnivory and predation is a reality there's no such thing as a vegan ecosystem i use nature and ecosystem ecology as a model for what i do we're in a transition period we may get to a place where we are ready willing and able to be fully non-animal but it's going to take a long time. And in the meantime, there are plenty of really hungry people and there's plenty of really degraded land. So why don't we kill two birds with one stone, you know, or multiple birds with one stone and implement systems that not only produce high quality food for those people in a way which is as ethical as it gets for the animals involved while regenerating ecological function in the meantime. Um, but yet yeah, veganism, I see it as half of it or part of it is really well motivated. Like I can understand it. If there's an animal welfare issue, it's well motivated. Then part of it is gross naivety to, um, ec ecological function and ecological illiteracy and ecological illiteracy I'll throw in here is one of the great, um, plagues on the planet right now. People don't know how the world works and ecology is the foundation of culture and we don't know how it works. Most people don't. And I would say like 90% of the most important people on the planet making, make, holding the resources and making the decisions and implementing stuff are ecologically literate. Like it drives me nuts. All of the people on their soapboxes and behind pulpits, politicians, thought leaders, authors, philosophers, you know, policy makers, you know, pop YouTube sensations. They don't know how the world works. They don't have an ecological literacy. It, it's nuts. So when they go and make these decisions or come to these conclusions, they are worse, they're, they're worse than half disinformed. They're missing the foundations. And I see that acutely in the vegan movement. And I also think in part, it's gross arrogance and violence actually. I have to say it like I, some of the stuff that's been said to me, uh, some of the stuff I've seen, not by all of them, of course, but there, there is a, a thread of that subculture that are, have, have, are totally fine, justifying themselves being as violent as they need to be for the sake of the, um, the animals that they think they're protecting and uh, from, from the people they think they're protecting them from. All this to say, I have to kind of reiterate, throw the disclaimer in that modern conventional agriculture has had the spotlight put on it and it's been, it's been recognized as being an incredibly destructive thing. And it is ecologically, it's destructive from an animal welfare issue. It's an issue from the health of the people downstream of the eating animal products grown in those environments, the stress, the hormones, what have you. It's like bad, 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 bad. And we eat too much meat and all that. 
And then you, you see movies like Cowspiracy. Now these things have to happen. It shows the worst of industrial animal agriculture and it needs to happen. It's good, good. It's uncomfortable, but I'm glad it needs to get out there. It needs to be exposed. However, they make, a, they seem to make many, I have observed that many proponents of that philosophy make a very fundamental mistake. And they say that conventional industrial scale animal agriculture is bad for these reasons that we discussed. Therefore, or ergo, all animal agriculture is bad. All animal agriculture is ecologically destructive. Destructive or deleterious on the health of the humans consuming it and ecologically, uh, sorry, ethically um, deplorable. It, and that's not the case. That's, it's not the case. We know students of the, and practitioners of regenerative agricultural principles know that animal agriculture not only can be ecologically regenerative and ethical and produce a lot of high quality food, but it's the only way forward. When you crunch the numbers, like, you know, you can, you can look into the tech solutions and the meat and test tubes and the industrial hydroponics and the growing algae on buildings and the vegan farms and the food forests, you know, like these regenerative agricultural practices, I have to agree with Savory, you know, and he's copped a lot of flack from saying that it's the only way that he can see desertification to be reversed but given the scale and the speed of of that that issue but i i agree i agree like holistically holistic rotational grazing is the only thing that can do it um so yeah they mistake the, the worst of conventional agriculture for all forms of ag agriculture involving animals going forth and that's not the case it's just not the case and that's why we need something to counter that bad marketing because people now see things like conspiracy sorry cowspiracy and it's so easy to point to the deforestation of the amazon to grow soy to feed to cows you know it's so easy to 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 see the connection between conventional animal agriculture and all these deleterious effects on ecology and human well-being and da 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 da. So we need to really highlight those positives that regenerative agriculture provide. <sighs> End rant. I think I got it all out. It was a good rant. It was a good rant. Thank you. Bro. Definitely the part about you know the if you choose between veganism and growing soybeans to chop down the rainforest to Brazil, people are going to choose veganism. But you have to see the other option. I, I, I'll, I'll really quickly add like that not only is there no such thing as a vegan or vegetarian ecology, it's that humans are a keystone species and we are a symbiotic species and there's nothing wrong with the symbiosis between a human and its egg laying chickens or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. That's a symbiosis, you know, lichen, look at lichen. Lichen is a, a, a symbiotic organism, which is composed of a fungi, which releases, uh, what is it? What kind of acid is it? Um, humic acids, I think, to break down rock, to give minerals to an algae, which it grows, lives with, which photosynthesizes to produce carbohydrates for the, the, the um, fungi lives off now like is that okay is the fungi oppressing the the algae you know is it is the is the as the algae oppressively domesticated the fungi right is there a master is there a slave no there's not it's a symbiosis our bodies are symbiotic you know we are the our very cells are the composite of different you know protokaryotic um single-celled organisms like mitochondria Right. So the, the issue is that humans are a keystone species. We are so much more powerful than we know what to do with. We're not selfish. We're not greedy. We're not broken. We don't have some deep genetic character flaw. 
You know, it drives me nuts, the misanthropism going around the world right now. It's destructive and it's not edgy or cool. It's juvenile and it's necessary, sort of. It's an understandable, inevitable, necessary phase, but it's juvenile and I hope we get over it because it's just destructive. You know, we're not bad, not only humans. Look what we've gone and done. It's like, no, look, look at what we, our burden. You know, what other animal out there is so powerful and so disoriented and so lost as to how it fits into the greater world and uh, so aware of the destruction it's having? I mean, people need to give themselves a break. Humanity needs to give itself a break. We've not done anything wrong. We're just figuring it out. We're figuring out how to manage how powerful we are. And we meant to be powerful because we're the goddamn stewards of this planet and that's the issue humans can be a, we are a keystone species and we can have as much beneficial effect as we do negative we just need to reconnect a meaningful reconnection to the planet and that's where regenerative agriculture is so beautiful because it offers this kind of embryonic starter kit to understand those principles of ecology and agriculture which is the way I define it, the interface between humanity and ecology. Well, I think I'll leave it there, mate. All right, good stuff. Oh boy, a marathon session, two hours, 45 minutes. Yeah, that was a blast, man. I know a lot of people here want to just hear you go on and on forever and ever because it is super important. I think that, that biggest part is a lot of us in this community need to listen about that conversation about apathy you know, regenerative agriculture, uncensored. We all, everyone's there. It's like, they're yeah. so intelligent. We see the world. It's like, we could only do this. And people are doing such stupid fucking things with like the mountain of money that could, you know, fix the earth in the span of five years, but it's it's yeah. not being done. It drives you crazy. But it we does, to, very frustrating. And, the, you know, I, I can't help but hear a sense of kind of like entitlement in my own voice when I say, if only people would do it the way we think it should be done. <laughs> You know? yeah. So, you know, God knows it's got to happen the way it, it's going to happen. But I just think that if people knew, if people woke up tomorrow and everyone out in the streets just knew what could be done and that we've, we're halfway there because we've pretty much worked out how to do it, then there would be a, a rush of enthusiasm and interest and resources toward it. That That was my point. Yeah. Hopefully around here the, the tech bubble will pop. And then the regenerative ag. Well, ho hopefully, hopefully we can use whatever remaining relatively affordable and uh, obtainable resources and, and, and tools we have at our disposal now to yeah. implement these types of systems before any bubble pops. That's a whole discussion. Yeah. All right, yeah. everybody. Well, thanks again All for right, tuning man. in. One last thing. Chat box, mm -hmm. Oak Tree Designs. That's uh, Byron's uh, design site where you can hire him for work and then the regenerative regen Australia's project is also in that chat box link and you can check yes. more webinars like this at sustainable design masterclass.com I, I am open pardon me mate I just I am open to travel um, for consultation and education and I love doing that so keep me in mind for you know PDCs Birthdays, bar mitzvahs, you know, <laughs> all of those kind of things. Birthday. What if it was a birthday PDC in Morocco? You, you were in Morocco a bunch of. How many years have you spent down there, pretty much? I've done. I've been there five times and Damn. three times for work. Yeah. That's cool. Yes, it is. I love Morocco. All right, everybody. Well, let's we'll close okay. it out. Everybody's gonna get the replay tomorrow. And Byron, thanks a lot, man. This is, this is really cool. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Cheers. You got it. See you soon. Peace, everybody.